Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Here at Cabinets HR, we're doing an equity crowdfunder on the WeFunder campaign. To learn more, go to https wefunder.com slash Cabinets HR. Our guest today is Pablo Casimus. Pablo, you ready to be great today? I'm excited. Let's do it. So, Pablo, how good of a salsa dancer are you? Uh, I'm all right. I'm not. So, like, a... so like you start dancing, people stop dancing and watch you and your partner dance or? Uh, it depends on where I am. So if I'm at, if I'm in Miami at a social, uh, not impressive at all, I'm <laughs> probably like not very good. But one time I was on a carnival or I was on a Royal Caribbean cruise and like there wasn't a lot of people that dance and I was dancing and everybody was looking at me like I was a professional. So it just depends on where I am exactly. So how long have you been doing salsa dance this year? This is a kid you picked up later on in life. Uh, later on in life, I uh, I first got inspired when I went to uh, my cousin's wedding in Cartagena, Colombia, back in 2017, and him and his bride uh, put on a performance, and it, I was like so amazed and like entertained, and I was like, I have to learn how to do this, and then, yeah, so I made it a goal to uh, when I got back to the U.S., uh, back to Gainesville, Florida, where I was a student at University of Florida. I said I want to I want to learn, and yeah. So is there like what's the difference between salsa and tango dancing? like it makes the same kind of dance or like different backgrounds or different pace or something they're actually very different um and the, the two styles that i dance the most are salsa and bachata um but tango is actually completely different i think tango originated in argentina i'm not 100 percent sure about that. that that sounds right um yeah and tango is actually yeah it's it's actually i've done a tango a little bit i've taken some classes um it's very like abstract um like you can kind of go in any direction. Salsa is more like uh, like concrete, like uh, you're dancing in a line, like back and forth. And then there's different moves you can do. Uh, but yeah, tango, you can kind of like step in any direction. At, you can speed it up, slow it down. Uh, whereas salsa, you're, I mean, I guess in both cases, you're going with the music. Mm -hmm. But yeah, tango, you have more options, I guess. So salsa, isn't salsa dance for like you for like switch partners, like on a regular basis or something like that? Or I have that wrong. Wait, say it again. Like salsa, isn't that where like you switch partners on a regular basis? Yeah. So yeah, usually like um like I go to salsa socials, like usually at socials, like every single time there's a new song, uh, you find a new partner and then okay. you dance for that song. So yeah. Okay. And here we had an instance where like you had a girlfriend or something, and like to so, like why you dance with her, you know, don't dance with her, or just like part of the culture dance. You whoever comes on Nick, you gotta dance with them. Like um speak. yeah. So I I didn't have that issue. I I think that sometimes happens, like sometimes like uh, in a relationship, maybe one of the partners is like not jealous or like, you know, yeah, not, jealous or insecure or, or something. Yeah. Or just not comfortable with that. And I think they usually like communicate that. Um, but yeah, in my last relationship, like that was not, that was never a problem. Like we would go to socials together yeah. and like, we would both dance with other people. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I had a good friend. Uh, uh, well, I was a married couple, right? We're both good friends. The lady was a avid salsa dancer. Like every Saturday night, I think every Wednesday or Saturday, she was going to salsa dance. Husband would never dance. Right. And she would always invite me. Like, I can't, I can't watch you dance on the men, right? And you go salsa dancing to yourself, but I'm, I'm too fucking jealous, right? <laughs> I can't yeah. do it. Like, have your fun, you know, come back safe at night and we're good, right? Yeah. And usually that's not super common with salsa. It's actually more common in bachata because there's um, part of bachata. There's a, like, it's called sensual bachata. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like when you're, you're kind of closer with your partner mm -hmm. and you're doing like body rolls yeah. and like other things that are a little bit more like intimate, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so in those cases, like a lot, like a lot more partners and relationships are maybe less comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, reasonably so, but so, yeah. how, how, have you been doing any salsa dancing here? Yeah, actually I have. Okay, yeah. Good, good. yeah. Um, yeah, actually quite a bit. So yeah. Good. Um, so do you like practice salsa dancing or you just do it as a hobby or like something fun for you to do? Yeah. You know, I, I do it for fun. I, it's kind of like my get my mind off of things and like meet people and like have a good time. Um, I do, I have taken classes previously. Like I've taken yeah. a lot of classes, but I haven't recently. Um, I do long-term. I want to get really good. Like I'd love to be like professional level or, you know, close to that one day. Um, but now it's not like, the time. Maybe going dance with the stars or something. Uh, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think I'll ever be that good. Um, but yeah, I, I would like to be like a pro one day, like be able to like put on a good performance um so like one day i want to do like like private lessons and stuff like okay. that but right now it's not the time i have too much going on right now how does it work like you're, you're, you're a salsa dancer with a bunch of people you don't know and like two people start salsa dancing 
One is like very high level. One is like a beginner. How does that work? Like, do they like quickly switch partners because they don't not a good uh, talent match, so to speak, or does like the person with the high skill kind of like cover for the low skill person? Yeah, that's actually a great question. So uh, it's really interesting. So usually different things ca- could happen there. Um, usually, if the experienced dancer is um, a nice person and open to maybe helping teach or just giving that person the opportunity to dance then they'll just have the dance with them sometimes you know they'll kind of like talk them through a little bit like oh you should do this or you should do that but sometimes they'll just enjoy the dance even though it's usually not very enjoyable because the other person does not uh really know what they're doing sometimes they're really stiff or um you as a lead you have to maybe like lead extra uh you have to be extra firm uh with your movements um but but yeah in some cases you'll have especially some people that are just like maybe a little bit uh i guess cocky or snobbish or whatever um they'll just be like oh no like i don't want to dance or they'll turn the person down okay um and is it like a like it does each salsa dance last one two one song two songs three songs yeah, it's just one song. Typically. So I won't do one song and you find us someone to switch. Yeah. And then sometimes like, I mean, if you have like a really good dance with somebody you've never met before, sometimes they'll be like, right. oh my gosh, like let's do another dance. Yeah. Like chemistry uh, hits or something. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes that happens, but usually. The general rule is songs over, you switch. Exactly. Yeah. That's what everybody does typically. Okay. So moving on, um, powerlifting. So you're, I, I don't know your measurements, right? But most people think of powerlifting, they think it's about like 6'4", 300 pounds, right? And so you're like, you know, not simple training for powerlifting, I don't think, right? How do you get interested in powerlifting? Yeah, actually, I've been doing powerlifting for a really long time. I picked it up actually for my brother, uh, my brother, who's like a year and a half older than me. Um, well, actually, even before that, I started going to the gym as a freshman in high school. Um, and when you first start going to the gym, you don't really know what you're doing. Um, so in the beginning, I would just do a bunch of random machines. And then my brother over time got into powerlifting. So like, doing like bench press, squat, deadlift. And so naturally, I mean, the first lift that I started doing in high school was bench press. That was like the first like non-machine lift that I would do. Um, And then over time, as you get more comfortable and you want to push yourself more. And so eventually I started doing deadlifts and squat was the last one for me to pick up because I, um, I just really struggled to get the form down. But yeah, it was in 20 at the end of 2014 i believe that i started squatting so yeah i've been i've been uh powerlifting now for almost a decade and and, and what do you get out of it like you do this mental health physical health just another hobby what's your, your your goal with it yeah it's it's a little bit of everything right so it's um i'm it helps clear my mind off things it's really healthy it is, there's a ton of benefits it's great for longevity so like um one of the the biggest issues that uh people have later on in life is that their muscles start to deteriorate and that could lead to a lot of other things like injury or breaking a bone or things that ultimately end up leading people to, to die. Right. Like if you break your hip or you fall or whatever. Uh, And so having strong muscles is like, is really, really important for that. And powerlifting is one of the best ways to, to combat that or to reinforce your, your, your bones and your muscles. Um, And so, so yeah, I, I, I do it for a lot of reasons. It's for me, it's like um, I love the challenge of it. It, it is something that you have to constantly be pushing yourself each time you go to the gym. It's like, Hmm, can I do five pounds more? Can I do 10 pounds more? Right. And you keep upping the weight and it's like a mental challenge, which keeps it really, really exciting and engaging. Um, it's also something that doesn't take a lot of time, right? I can go to the gym one hour, twice a week, three times a week, um, get my workout in and, um, and you feel good. You feel great afterwards. Um, you obviously get really a lot hungrier. Uh, but it helps you in every aspect, helps you with your sleep. Um, so yeah. So what's the difference between like powerlifting as regular weightlifting? Yeah, I, I, you know, I feel like, um, when you say regular weightlifting, you are probably referring to like just somebody who just goes to the gym and like works out and like maybe does like curls or machines. Uh, so powerlifting specifically refers to, uh, compound lifts. So typically you're talking about deadlift squat and bench press. Those are the, the three main ones, but there's a couple of others. Um, like overhead press. And uh, I, I believe there's a few more, but those are kind of like the standard lifts um, in, in competitions. When you're doing competition powerlifting, the main three are deadlift, bench, and squat. And have you entered any, any, have you entered any powerlifting contests? Never. Um, maybe one day I, I kind of want to, but it's not really a priority. I have like, 
So in the back of my head, I have like certain goals that I want to hit, like certain weights I want to hit. And once I'm able to hit those weights, I feel like I'll be like, all right, maybe I'll enter a lo- like a local or regional competition um, just to see kind of like where I place. And you go to back in Miami, you go, do, do you go to gym specifically at only tailors to like powerlifters or you just go to a regular gym? Yeah, just a regular gym. So when I lived in, um, so back when I lived in Gainesville, Florida, I would go to a, for my last two years living there, I would go to a specialty powerlifting gym. And that was actually really great because it helped every single time I was there, I had a coach and it was a really good coach. He's a starting strength certified coach. Uh, and he would correct my form. And I'd been powerlifting by that time. I'd been, already been powerlifting for five or six years. And so I thought that my lifts were like great, that like my form was great. And I realized that I actually had a lot of issues with my form and like I got corrected. And so now I think my form, my form on all of my lifts is a lot better than it used to be because of that. But yeah, normally like when I'm here, I just go to like LA fitness. When I'm back home, I go to like a gym called crunch. Um, so yeah. So I'm sure you don't know the answer to this, but best based on the best guess, how many people that lift weights do powerlifting or do you use the wrong form? You think I, I think it has to be pretty high, right? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, the, the thing, the other thing is that the majority of people don't do powerlifting. The, most, the majority of people that, that do weightlifting don't do powerlifting. Uh, and so the ones that do oftentimes they're people that are, that are, they've been doing it for a while and like they have the form down, yeah. but there are a lot that. But like uh, you in the gym, you see somebody doing like a curl and they were like swinging the arms up like that and stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or like um, one of the most common ones that I see mistakes is like on squat you'll see somebody like um, there's no range of motion. Like they'll just squat like two inches or like, like four inches and then they go back up. Uh, and usually people that are newer to powerlifting and they like, they just want to like put on a lot of weight. Yeah. They're like, Oh yeah. Like I'm doing like 250 or like 300. And they didn't bend the knees or anything like slight bent. Yeah. You want, usually want, you want to go to parallel, which yeah. is when your your the, your thought, your, the upper part of your leg is parallel with the floor um and so i'm sure some of them are probably scared they're gonna get the weight back up or they're gonna scare the injure themselves you know by doing the correct form maybe yeah definitely i mean the form is super important and so it's it's always better to get the form down first and then start to up the weight for yeah. sure so next is brazilian jiu-jitsu and jiu-jitsu the same thing or there's two different things um yeah it's basically the same thing um brazilian jiu-jitsu is just uh the standard name for it um, I've actually, I don't think I've heard of like a non-Brazilian jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu gym. I'm sure there are, but, uh, I, yeah, that's, that's usually what they call them, what, what they call the, the sport, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And how long have you been doing that? Um, I actually started in high school. I started, uh, like my sophomore or junior year of high school. And, um, in the beginning it was like really uncomfortable. Like I, I actually, I was just doing it cause my brother was doing it and we were both doing it. Um, after actually my, like my second or third class. I was obviously like a white belt, didn't know what I was doing and like a brown belt that I was going against, which brown belt is like the next, the one right before black. And this guy like tried some new move on me. Like I heard him say this to one of his buddies after he was like, oh, I I was able to land this move that I saw on YouTube last week. And he like completely like misaligned like my entire back. And so for like two months, I remember the next day I, I went to school the next day and like one of my legs was like higher than the other like one of my shoulders was higher than the other and like it was horrible I had to go to a chiropractor and like so yeah it was a rough start but uh yeah I went to a couple of different gyms and then found one that I ended up sticking with and got really into it and um did you try any other like martial arts as a kid I did taekwondo growing up uh from the time I was in third grade till about fifth or sixth grade I did taekwondo um but that was you know my parents forced me to do that so so you do salsa dancing. How often do you do salsa dancing? Just whenever you can or? Yeah, I would say like uh, once once or twice a week. Okay. And then how often do you do the powerlifting? Uh, about twice a week, and I would then, say. And then the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu twice a week? Twice a week, yeah. So yeah. You, you have a pretty hectic social schedule. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff going on on top yeah. of like all like the startup events that I yeah. go to, events that I put on. Obviously work is like my priority, so but I'm sure it makes you a better person, more balanced, more organized, you know, doing that stuff, you know, getting your mental health done versus just like working, working, working over things. Yeah. I think like, it's super important to take care of your mental health, right? Like if you want to build a billion dollar company, or if you want to build a top venture capital firm or whatever you want to do at a world-class level, then you need to have your mental health, uh, 
top of mind. Like that needs to be your priority as well as your physical health, right? So eating right, sleeping right, uh, exercising. And so all those things for me, uh, they are a way for me to uh, keep my mental health in check, meet a lot of great people, um, have a good time, and then also, um, you know, get some good exercise in as well. So like, I know you do a lot of networking, especially in Seattle. A lot of them like start at six, eight, eight, eight at nine, eight at nine o'clock, you probably get home at 10, probably stay up a little bit late. So how do you like balance like your mental health when you know you have to stay up late doing this networking stuff? For sure. Yeah. So that this is, um, I've, I feel like I've gotten my, uh, exercise habits down. I've gotten diet down for the most part. I have a lot of really healthy habits. The, the last one that I'm really working on now is trying to get my sleep, uh, to be consistently, you know, getting six to eight hours, but ideally seven or eight hours a night. Uh, and that's been the most difficult for me. So yeah, there's many nights where I definitely don't do, don't get that amount of sleep. Now, so. do, you, do you prefer like go to bed at 10 and wake up early in the morning? Or do you prefer like stay up to midnight when the morning, wake up eight or nine o'clock? Like, what do you, I'm, I'm a night you? owl. I, I, okay. I'm not a morning person. I wake up at, I wake up in the morning early all the time because I have to for meetings or calls or whatever it is, but I am not a morning person. I, uh, I've gone through phases over the past uh, couple of years, you know, when we were building our accelerator, when we were building our firm, um, which we're still building, uh, that I spent many, many nights staying up consistently staying yeah. up till like four or five, mm -hmm. six AM. Yeah, I've had many nights where I'm up working, the sun comes out and I'm still working. Um, so yeah, that's the one that I really need to work on. And I've gotten better about it actually this, this whole summer. Um, but I still have a long way to go. Okay. And, um, and your parents, they were born in the Dominican Republic. My mom was. Your mom was? Yeah. Okay. And so this, she came from the Dominican Republic. How, how often do you go over there to visit yourself? Almost every year, actually. Okay. Yeah. I have, so I've done the math. I have between aunts, uncles, and cousins, I have over, on, over 100. Okay. In just the capital alone, in Santo Domingo. Okay. Um, so yeah, I try to go once a year or once every two years, um, spend time with family or sometimes just like as a vacation on I go to like Punta Cana sometimes, which is like the really touristy area um, to like all inclusive resorts. But um, but yeah, it's a great country. It's so beautiful. The people there are like so generous, like they will give you the best of whatever they have. If you walk in somebody's house, it doesn't matter if they're poor and they don't have a lot. They will offer you whatever food they have, whatever drinks they have. Um, I love it. I, I love going there. It's it's amazing. So you know, most Americans get an F minus on geography, right? So I'm sure most people don't have a idea what's that. So Dominican Republic actually shares an island with Haiti, correct? That's correct. Yeah. And so one thing that interests me, of course, I might be ignorant of this, but it's like you always hear news about Haiti, like there's another earthquake, there's another riot, there's another something else. Like, man, Haiti can't get a break. I know. But it's like Dominican Republic, I mean, at least you don't hear them about the news, like stuff getting bad. It's like those it islands, like that, that much different between Haiti and Dominican Republic as far as stuff is going on. Like, the say this, let's have a bad luck, or just we don't hear what's going on in the Dominican Republic. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, and I don't have the full answer here, but um, there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, I think luck, I mean, bad luck, yeah, that's part of it for sure with the earthquakes, right? Because like we never really hear about earthquakes like in, in Dominican Republic. Uh, but then when you go back in, to the history of it, right? So because yeah, Haiti was actually colonized by France, I believe. By France, yeah. That revolt was like Dominican Republic ever like colonized or anything like that? Or they were by the by the Spanish. Spanish, yeah. okay. Yeah, so Dominicans are a combination of Spanish, Spaniards, and uh, the Taino Indians. Um, and I believe there's like one other uh, uh, population that was part of that. But but, um, but yeah, I think the difference between the way the Spanish would colonize and the way the French would colonize, that was what led to, you know, the differences there. And then also like um, technically Haiti... Uh, they actually overruled the French. So they, because they revolted, they were the only successful slave revolt. Yeah, I remember that story. I can't yeah. remember the guy's name. I remember that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, Ben Horowitz uh, wrote about it in one of his books. I forget the name of it, but he has a really good book where he talks about the the history there. And um, and yeah, unfortunately, what you've had is you've had for history. I mean, since the revolt, you've had a lot of corruption with the leadership there. You've had a lot of corruption with the the wealthiest people there. Um, there's a lot of crime. There's it's the way that they they're doing things in Haiti is it it seems almost like the way that 
humans would get things figured out like 300 years ago, you know, like just fight somebody, kill somebody, take what you want, you know. Um, Now, obviously, this is with my limited context. I've never been to Haiti, uh, but I have good friends that are Haitian and uh, and I've talked with them quite a bit. And this is what it seems like is going on over there. There's a lot of corruption, um, which I mean, there's corruption in every country, but there's just like different levels of it. And I think Dominican Republic just hasn't seen that level of corruption. Um, and also the other thing is that Dominican Republic has had the benefit of the tourism industry. Uh, when you think of like destinations that you want to go visit, there's a lot of people that would say, I really want to go to Dominican Republic. Yeah, I know quite a few people there for the honeymoons and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Or get, get married over there. Um, or have a cruise stop over there, but how many people talk about I want to go to Haiti? Yeah, I mean on vacation, I, 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 right? I mean Haiti is a beautiful country. Country, but I've heard like you go to Haiti, you gotta you know give like you know the corruption fee, right? You yeah. gotta pay this guy this tax, this guy this tax, you know. Yeah, and then here's the other thing is that one of the reasons that the Dominican Republic is just naturally or appears more beautiful uh, is that the the French when they were colonizing uh, they got into uh, farming tobacco, right? And and I believe even Haitians beyond that. And tobacco drains the nutrients from the soil. And so you've got a country that just it has had everything happen to them, right? On top of the soil. I, I mean, you're a Haitian, drain. you gotta be like, man, are you kidding me? Like what else could come? Like I remember one time like, I had an earthquake one year, like a year later I had another earthquake, this is bad. And like, who's and just back to back. Yeah, hurricanes, uh, which hurricanes hit both, but but yeah, they've they've had some tough luck. Now, is that an open border between the two countries? Like, can people of both countries, like, go back across the border like we do in Canada, Mexico, kind of, sort of? Yeah, that, I don't fully know the answer there. But from what I remember hearing is that Dominicans are Dominicans are actually trying to keep, almost, like, put up a wall or, mm-hmm. like, prevent Haitians from coming to, okay. to Dominican Republic. This is what I've heard. Um, and so it's difficult. Uh, there's tons of, ha- of Haitians in Dominican Republic. But... I know it's not easy for them to get there. I actually got the chance of meeting uh, Wyclef Jean when I was okay. in Miami um, nice. back in April. And uh, I, I got to hear his story and he's he's got a fascinating story. I mean, he was literally like talking about, he's he said this quote, he said, um, when I say I made it from the donkey to the Ferrari, he's like, I mean it. He's like, I grew up in a hut. He's like, I don't know if you know what a hut looks like. He's like, I'm talking about one pair of underwear for the year. And he now obviously platinum artist, um, you know, extremely successful, accomplished. Uh, He's like, when I first came to the United States and I was living in the projects, he's like, I said, y'all are weak. He's like, I don't know what struggle is. Yeah, y'all don't know what poor is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's incredible to see what some people have gone on to accomplish, you know, growing up in those circumstances and making it out of there. And, um, but yeah, I think that, you know, the, I think the country could use a lot of help. And I, and I think that there's a lot of issues that they have to fit, they have to deal with. Yeah. I was in the army for 25 years. I tell people all the time, like most Americans have no idea what poor really is. Right. They have no idea what destitute. Yeah. Is. Everything is perspective. Yeah. Everything is perspective for yeah. sure. So how close is the Dominican Republic to, to, to the United States? Is it like a two hour flight, three hour flight? Yeah. From Miami, it's about, I think two and a half or three. Okay. So really, really close then. Yeah. Relatively. Yeah. And um and and so you remember how you know how old your mother was when she came over here? Um, she was in her twenties. Okay. I don't know the exact age, but uh, I believe like late twenties, or let me see, it it may have been early thirties. And, and you were born in Miami. I was, yeah. So my mom actually came to Miami with three kids as a single mother. Okay. So she uh, things didn't work out with her ex husband at the time, and she took her kids and she's like, I I, I want to pursue a better future. And I want to have a better life for my for my kids. And so she took her three kids and went to Miami without knowing how to speak English, without having a plan. She had a friend of a friend of a friend or something that let her crash and she like slept on her and her kids slept on a balcony uh, for their first couple of months when they were in Miami and, until she was able to get on her feet. And from there, she ended up uh, getting a job at uh, Burger King, actually, in the drive through She would go there every single day, like, asking them to hire her. And, like, they kept telling her no because she didn't speak English. And eventually, they hired her. Uh, and so she was working the drive through without speaking English. She would always tell me that she hated when uh, people would say, like, no pickles, extra cheese, no ketchup. 
because she didn't know what any of that meant. And so she's like, can you just take the burger? <laughs> you know how it comes. Uh, and she had two jobs. So, I mean, obviously you're trying to support three kids and you're making minimum wage. So she was working Burger King night shift at the drive to do. And then during the days she was working at Sears uh, folding clothes. Um, so, yeah. So how, how did this happen? Like, you know, you're a kid, teenager, kids for me. And maybe you're struggling with something. You're like, man, I can't do this. Your mom gives us a side. I look like, son, are you kidding me right now? All the stuff done. You better, you're like, fucking suck it up and figure this shit out. Yeah, for real. I mean, um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, you know, I don't remember too many of those conversations, but I'm sure that maybe she felt that way quite a bit. Um, the other thing that I found really fascinating or interesting is that um, when I first wanted to start a company, it was like my mom wasn't super like, supportive in the beginning. She, she was more like, just get a job. You know, she just wanted like job security and, and for me and my siblings to have like a good, a good paying job that's stable. Right. Uh, but when I think about it, you know, being an immigrant is like the truest form of an entrepreneur, right? You're like leaving behind everything that you have going to a new country with nothing and not sure about the challenges that lie ahead. Right. Which is like the same thing, right? The analogy that uh, I know Jeff Hoffman said this, a lot of people have said this analogy, but it's like jumping off a cliff and trying to build a parachute on the way down, right? And so that's kind of what being an immigrant is. And so when I think back to my parents being immigrants and then me starting a company or starting or trying to build a firm, I think there's a lot of overlap there, but it was interesting for me to see how like for my mom and my, and my dad in the early days, they just wanted job security. They didn't want me to and they didn't think that this was a good idea or anything, you know, in the early days. Now they're very supportive. It's it's different, but um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's just interesting. So this is one thing that kids me off of this country, right? Like the United States are built on immigrants, right? Immigrants build a country. We have people nowadays like, oh, there's too many immigrants over here. Let's put up bears and stuff. And of course, there's some people coming here want to do bad things. Of course, you know, there's always bad people in groups. Like the majority of people, like your mother, right? they want to come over. You know, they want to have a better life. And like, the my thing is like. When it becomes a day where people don't want to come to America, that's what you should be worried, right? If people come to America, I think we're doing a good job. Agreed. I agree. I mean, I think it's it's one of those things that it's not an easy problem to solve. You can't just say, like, let's open the borders and let anybody and everybody come to the U.S. At the same time, there needs to be a better system for people that are genuinely hardworking, want to contribute to society, or just want a better future uh, to be able to come here and, you know, work hard and do, you know, make a better life for themselves. Right. Like there needs to be a better process for this, I think. Um, and I think we have a long way to go for our country to figure that out. And I think that there's a lot of long-term potential and benefit if we can, if we can figure that out, because like you said, a lot of immigrants contribute more to society than a lot of people that were born in oh, this country. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I believe there's a, there's a statistic and I can't remember the exact amount. Um, but I believe more than 50% of fortune 500 CEO or executives or CEOs maybe are immigrants. It was something like that yeah, 50 or 60%. High, yeah. Um, so yeah, these people are working hard, they're contributing. And then others are taking the jobs that no Americans want to work. Yeah, right? like ain't no American picking strawberries in the field, right? Yeah, like exactly. That, when I, my first post-armory job, I, I did HR for a seafood plant in Alaska, right? I mean, it's, it's, it paid good, right? If you, if you work overtime, you work 16 hours a day, you would make like $6,000 a month, right? But it's hard work. You got to stay there, cut fish. I mean, it's not easy, right? Maybe we might add up 600 people in the plant, maybe three were Americans. Yeah. Most were Filipinos or um, third country uh, from Africa countries like like um, Uganda, Somalia, Kenya, right? We would have no Americans, right? maybe two or three, right? And we would go yeah. like try to recruit Americans, right? Like, shit, I ain't doing that because most people can't stand on their feet for eight, eight hours, right? Yeah, it's it's intense labor. And, you know, people who are coming from another country, they have a different mindset. They're willing to do whatever it takes, right? There's a difference between needing something and wanting something. Oh, yeah, big difference. And, you know, Americans, a lot of Americans that are born here, and maybe had a comfortable upbringing, a lot of them may want to succeed and want to have a better future. But when you come here as an Im immigrant, you need it. You need to be able to provide for yourself. You need to be able to provide for your family. And so it's a different mindset and you're willing to do different things, right? You're willing to work harder. You're willing to take jobs that others who are not willing to do that wouldn't take. Yeah, I think America's always had like an interesting uh, relationship with immigrants. Like, like you go back in history, there's always some kind of law like, the Chinese law, the Italian law, like where they cut like, you know, quotas like in half or a third, no more Chinese, 
the Chinese build a railroad. Okay, no more Chinese here, right? You know, or Irish. So it's like always generation is always like a log of a certain group of people, you know? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And then um, speaking of being soft, so you know who Evander Holyfield is, right? Yeah. You ever heard this quote from him? He had a quote one day where he said, uh, it's hard to be hungry when, you seek, when you're sleeping in silk sheets. Yes. <laughs> I, I love that quote. I mean, I haven't heard it before, but I, I, I love that quote. Yeah. So, so next, talk about your content market agency. I think it's called Rutex. Yeah, that was my first company. Um, initially started. So going back to the, the immigrant thing, you know, when I first went to college, I really was fascinated by the world of entrepreneurship and business. But again, my parents always wanted security. They wanted job security for me. And so they would always tell me, you have to be a doctor, lawyer, or an engineer. And for me, like I want a business, but I ended up choosing engineer because I hated reading and writing. So I wasn't going to be an attorney or a lawyer. Um, I couldn't stand being in a hospital and seeing blood and I didn't want to be a doctor. So engineer was the most clear path. So I studied industrial engineering. Um, after two years, I got my first internship with a fortune 50 company called Pratt and Whitney. They're under United Technologies Corporation and Pratt and Whitney makes jet engines for military and commercial jets. And after one month of being there, I realized I was miserable. I said, I don't want to work nine to five. I don't want to be an engineer. And I'd never want to work for a corporation. And so immediately I came up with the idea for my first company. I would sit at my desk at work, brainstorming, watching YouTube videos, listening to audiobooks, And I wanted to do something that I knew would have long-term value, even if I failed, because I knew there would be a high likelihood of failure when you're starting your first company, not knowing anything. So I picked uh, content marketing, video marketing, because I realized One, I would always enjoy doing video projects when I was uh, in high school. And so the other reason was because I knew it was a valuable skill set, right? Anybody, every company needs marketing. Every organization needs marketing in some capacity, right? Uh, Content is a valuable tool for different purposes, marketing, but it could also be used for education. It could be used for all kinds of things. And so that was my first company. Uh, Initially, the first idea was... uh, (laughs) <laughs> kind of silly, but uh, there was a, a thing back at the University of Florida and other college towns have this too. Some of them have different names for it, but it's called a sign night. And so when, when a girl's turning 21 years old, she will have like a sign night. And so her friends will print out this sign uh, that will have like a combination of like everything that the girl loves, whether it's like an album or like a food or like you know, whatever, whatever describes their personality on the back of it, there's 21 things that they have to do that night when they go out on the 21st birthday. And so they wear the sign out that whole night. And so I had been to a couple of those sign nights and I said, you know what, these are such like fun experiences and like, uh, great memories. Why don't we record these? Right. Especially because most people are not going to remember most of their 21st birthday party, you know? So, uh, so that was the initial idea for my first company. It's like, let's go record sign nights. Let's record, you know, parties and events, um, and memories. And so, uh, it was called raw moment studios and then quickly realized students don't have a lot of money. They're not willing to pay a lot of money. And so we pivoted and started doing content for nonprofits, uh, other organizations and companies, uh, based in Gainesville. And so, yeah. So what lesson did you learn from that, that helped you build your VC firm? Um, yeah, it was a long journey. I was running that company from basically the beginning of 2016 up until about a year and a half ago. And so many lessons learned there. Um, everything from sales to negotiation to um, having contracts and the, important, the importance of contracts um, to networking, organizing events. Uh, I learned so much that was critical later on when I had to build a venture firm or started to build a venture firm. And are you still pretty involved in the Miami and you and use their Florida startup scene? Yeah, yeah, pretty, Can pretty. Can you talk about those two scenes there? Yeah, totally. Um, I'll first talk about Gainesville because this is a, a core part of why we're even doing what we're doing. So when I was a student at the University of Florida, I kept hearing the same thing over and over again. The, the smartest people in town would always say, there's no capital here. If you want to build a startup, you have to leave. You have to go to San Francisco. You have to go to New York. You have to go somewhere else. There's no VCs here. There's no angels here. There's no capital. And so in 2017, to help solve that problem, a couple of friends and I got together and we started hosting meetups and events, uh, 
quickly gain traction with these events for our founders. And three years later, we were putting on the largest startup events in Gainesville, Florida. Um, throughout that time period, I really got to know the ecosystem and realized there, there was actually, they were right, there was no capital there, but there was two things missing. It's not just the capital. The other thing that was missing was education. Education around how to start a startup, how to build an MVP, how to talk to users, how to get your first 10 customers, how to create a pitch deck, how to pitch, how to raise capital, right? None of these things were being taught, or if they were, there wasn't any formal or good programming to teach these things. Uh, and so that's what we realized. And that's kind of what led us down this road of doing what we're doing now. Um, but with that being said, there is so much talent there. The University of Florida is a top five public university in the country. There's over 50,000 students there. There's over 10,000 engineering students there. It's one of the top engineering, uh, one of the top public engineering schools in the country. And there have been, there have been consistent successes that have come out of there, right? So uh, if you look back and like, to, if you look back on companies that have come out of the University of Florida or that have been started by University of Florida alumni, so there's actually plenty that have reached, you know, 500 million plus valuation. Uh, the biggest one being NVIDIA. One of the co-founders of NVIDIA is a UF alumni, Chris Malachowski. Uh, and he actually just recently donated $50 million to the University of Florida. And now they have the, they have a, a brand new building in the heart of campus uh, for machine learning, data science, artificial intelligence. And they have the most advanced supercomputer for AI of any university in the country. And this is opening up this fall right? So NVIDIA is one, but there's a lot of others. Archer, which is a drone company. Um, uh, Proctor U, uh, which was acquired by Measure Learning for uh, a big sum of money. Uh, and there's many others. Papa, one of the co-founders of Papa, which uh, reached unicorn status. Stax, which is a fintech startup that became a unicorn about two years ago. Uh, and there's many, many others. So the data is there, right? The history is there. The, the talent is there. And the the lack that the thing that's missing is the capital and the education and so that's why we started doing what we were doing doing those events back in 2017 and that's what led us down this road uh, and this is why we still have a presence there to this day um i know that was a long answer but now going to the other side that you asked about miami so miami's tech ecosystem i would really say that it's one of those things that uh, it's really it, it there was no tech ecosystem like past 10 years ago. Like the 10, 10 years ago is kind of when things started to develop. And one of the biggest organizations there, uh, or I guess one of the biggest pioneers of Miami's tech startup ecosystem, uh, his name is Manny Medina. And they call him the godfather of Miami tech. And so Manny Medina actually here, speaking about immigrants, he came to Miami on a raft from Cuba back in the 60s, uh, ended up getting into commercial real estate development built and developed some of the largest uh, and nicest high rises in Miami and Brickell, including the Four Seasons, and then pivoted, got into tech, started a company called Terramark. They sold in 2011 for $2.3 billion to Verizon. And which is, this, this is like fascinating because at the time of that exit, they could have purchased for that sum of money, $2.3 billion, they could have purchased all three major sport, major league sports teams that were in Miami, the Miami Heat, the Miami Dolphins, and the Miami Marlins for that sum of money. So anyways, what they chose to do is they started this organization called Emerge Americas, which has gone on to be the largest um, accelerator of, the, of, of Miami's tech flywheel, I, I would say. Uh, Emerge America started by doing events, right? They would do an annual tech summit, tech innovation summit, in Miami, and it grew to be massive. It's the largest tech innovation and venture event in Florida that happens every year. It usually happens during Miami Tech Week in April. Um, and that event has brought in people like Steve Wozniak. It's brought in people like this past year, Eric Schmidt, Tom Brady. Um, one of the co-founders of Emerge Americas is actually Pitbull, the Latin artist. So what was it a Mr. Worldwide, right? Mr. Worldwide, yeah. <laughs> or Mr. 305. Mr. 305. Yeah. yeah. So when Manny, uh, when Manny was first, him and his daughter uh, were starting Emerge together. When they were first, uh, him and Melissa, when they were talking about starting Emerge, they said, who is a household name? Who is somebody that can help us reach the masses? 
and get everybody interested in tech and innovation and venture. And they came up with Pipple and, you know, he's, he has a great story. He's oh, yeah. a Cuban immigrant uh, or uh, born to immigrant parents and, and raised in Miami, grew up in a really rough neighborhood and made something of, of himself. Yeah. I love Not this. by luck, but by yeah. working really hard. And every single thing, you know, uh, there's no failure. There's only learning that whole speech he gives that went like, viral everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he has said this, I've heard him speak so many times. And one of the things that I love that he says, he says that the music industry is 1% talent, 99% hustle. Yeah. And I believe it. I mean, yeah. this is everything, right? Whatever industry you're in is, you know, 1% talent, 99% hustle. Absolutely. So, so going back to your question, Miami's tech ecosystem, um, it was initially, I guess, started, uh, kicked off by Emerge America's, the Medina family, Pitbull, um, and really um, had a spike in 2017, 2018, when uh, the crypto and Web3 started to take off, right? Yeah. So when Bitcoin had first gone up, up to hit uh, $20,000 and there was this, uh, this craze, all of a sudden, Mayor of Miami, another key contributor to the ecosystem. Uh, is, that the Francis, one, is that the one who's running for president running now? President, okay. Francis Suarez, yeah. And what he's done in Miami is absolutely incredible. Uh, and so he, I have, I have seen this, I've, I've met him on many occasions, had conversations with him because he shows up to all the tech events. He shows up, he speaks at all the big nice. major. So he's like invested. He's like, he doesn't talk the talk. He actually walk in the walk and, like, and put his time in, into it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So many yeah. people say, oh, we're in tech or whatever industry you want to pick. I'm in it. And they're like, there's nowhere to be found. Yeah, no, 100%. And so he's, yeah, like you said, he's, he's walking the walk. So uh, and he helped accelerate the the adoption of like crypto and Web3 in Miami. And all of a sudden, everybody's like, all right, let's go build a Web3 startup in Miami. And so that ecosystem really took off, obviously, with, you know, the different events that have occurred and uh, fraud and, um, you know, the crypto market, the uh, ups and downs um, that has kind of hurt that ecosystem a little bit, but it's still there. And there are still some startups that are in that space that are thriving and growing. Um, but that was the initial, you know, big spike and big wave. And now fast forward to after COVID hit, um, you know, ev there's a lot of places in this country that were closed, uh, for a long time after COVID and, you know, Seattle being one of them and, you know, the state of Florida, uh, they had a different way of addressing Florida, the Texas, pandemic. yeah, like, yeah. you want to visit Texas, like no one had a mask on, like. Like fuck COVID, we're Texas, you know. Right, and you know I'm not going to say you know which I which approach I think was more effective or better. Uh, I won't give my opinion on that. But one thing that benefited Florida, uh, Florida's economy, was remaining open or yeah. closing for just a short period of time. And so everybody said, you know, we can't run our businesses here. We're going to move to Florida. We're going to yeah. move to Miami. And so now you've got fast forward the flywheel is in effect, and now you've got all these massive hedge funds, private equity firms, uh, and startups and tech companies that have relocated and have offices in Miami. Yeah. Um, so they're think they were taking a lot of people move from like California, Chicago, Texas, you know, you know, Pac move there. Obviously the biggest one, Tesla. Uh, I can't, there's a Caterpillar move from Chicago, you know, just that they were open for business, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 One of the companies that moved uh, uh, from Chicago to Miami, Cameo, which is okay. a unicorn startup. That's the and, one like the uh, celebrities make little videos, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so the founder Steve Galanis, yeah. we we actually uh, we met him at one of the events in Miami, and he's actually coming to Gainesville, Florida, to speak for an event that we're putting on. He's going to be one of the keynote speakers there. Nice. Um, but yeah, there's been many others that have moved down there and started or moved their companies, and um, and it's exciting. The fly was in full effect. It's growing. It's not stopping anytime soon. Um, and you know, we we spend about half the year in Miami, and we do some stuff down there, and we're you know, looking to continue contributing to that ecosystem as well. So, so change subject for a little bit. I don't go, I, I will go back to tech, but uh, are you a Florida Marlins fan? Um, to be honest with you, I've never been too big on like many sports. Like okay. basketball is my, was my main sport mm -hmm. growing up. And then uh, now I'm, I'm like really into like martial arts and like okay. MMA. So like UFC. Mm -hmm. So my two biggest sports that I watch and follow are uh, UFC and NBA. Okay. Um, so I'm a big Miami Heat fan. All right. But might get Dame, Dame, what's Dame Dollar pretty soon? What it looks like. The what? Damon Lillard might be going to y'all pretty soon. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. At least yeah. a few months ago. And to be completely honest, I don't follow the day to day. Mm -hmm. I usually just watch the games when we're in the playoffs. Yeah. Um, because I just, I'm doing too much. I don't watch much TV at all. 
Um, I watch fights more often because those are more irregular. They're, I mean, they're not as they're not as frequent. It's hard to keep up with games when you have like two or three games a week. Yeah, that's a lot. So, so yeah, I don't really follow the the normal season. I just once uh, we're in the pay- playoffs, I start watching the games. But I am a big fan, and I grew up watching the the Heat games as well. Okay. So, what's your take on this, right? And I'm kind of exaggerating. Like, so like some startup people that say, if you're a founder, you know, within nine days, have the MVP, product market fit, make money. And other than people say, well, it's a long journey, five, six, seven years. Like, to me, it's like two extremes, right? Like, how do you balance those two? Like, to me, the, the advice from those two groups, like, contradictory, you know? So anybody who says that starting a startup is an easy process or a quick way to make a lot of money is bullshitting or they just don't know what they're talking about. Building a startup is a long-term thing. The average timeline from start to exit is seven to 10 years for a startup. And so I would never take advice or listen to somebody who's telling you that you can build a billion dollar company or a successful startup in two years. Uh, Now, that's not to say that it hasn't been done. It has been done, Uh, but those are the exceptions. And there's usually a lot of... um, there's usually a lot of variables there that are not revealed. So like people talk about these case studies as if like, oh yeah, like they did it, I can do it. And then they're missing some key part of the story. Like maybe that person was building a startup based on another business they had already started and they already had all the connections and they already had the the validation and all these things. Or maybe they were, uh, they've already sold three startups now they're building another one and so again, there's a lot of variables there, but I would never start a startup because you want to achieve something uh, remarkable in a very quick fashion, or you want to make a lot of money quickly. Um, it is absolutely a grind. It is a hard thing. Um, there's not really any shortcuts, you know, that you, you've got to, it's, it's a long process. You have to go through the motions. You have to, you have to talk to users. You have to build a product that people love. Um, and there's not really any way to get around that. And there's no easy way to do those things. Typically, uh, it's, it's usually quite a challenge. So, yeah. So we talk about, you know, what our like capital is like is San Francisco, Seattle, you know, New York City, Boston, you know, make, what do you mean face that? So if you're in a big city, even you're like, maybe you're like saying Dallas, Texas, right? It's hard to get capital, but it's not that hard, right? But if you're like, you know, um, rural county, Alabama with 300 people in it, and you have a great idea and you have some traction, like how do you get money, right? How do you get funny, right? How do you, how do you like, how do you, I mean, is that even a problem we can fix or need to fix, you know? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, today's world is a little bit different than it was five years ago because after COVID, there are so many resources that surfaced on, at a virtual capacity. So I think there's a lot of accelerators in this country that are actually remote. Um, maybe a lot of them are going back to in-person, but there's still some that are remote. And, you know, there's other programs that have done a great job reaching out and getting plugged into different ecosystems like Techstars, for example. And like, there's actually a Techstars, I believe it's Birmingham um, or one of those, I think it's Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, So again, if you're in one of these cities in Alabama, that's maybe like out in the woodworks and you have an idea and you want to start a startup, that's your first step. I mean, you, if you really believe in it and you really are willing to make the sacrifices, moving to Birmingham for a couple of months or commuting back and forth shouldn't be something to stop you, right? Um, So I I do think there's something to be said about being in the right places. Uh, It's very hard to build a startup successfully if you're in the mountains of, I don't know, West Virginia and you don't have any Wi-Fi, like good luck, right? Um, Although I have heard that uh, I think West Virginia is actually one of the fastest or one of the faster growing startup ecosystems in the country by percentage points. Um, but I, I think like you need to be in a, you need to be in a place where you can hire talent, where you can raise capital. Even if you can do a lot of these things virtually, there's some things that you're going to Yeah, need. I'll probably get killed for this. I, when you say Virginia, like a tech, like I just had emails like a guy mass producing banjos, you know, with no Wi-Fi, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, so, I, and like ordering, like ordering moonshine or Apple something, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think like probably both of our perceptions are like completely far off from oh, yeah. reality. Yeah. Uh, because I did see an article not too long ago that like West, I think was West Virginia's startup ecosystem is one of the fastest growing uh, by percentage in the country. So there's something going on. It was either West Virginia or Virginia, but one of the two. So talk about the points and you, and you do a great job of this. The points of people putting themselves out there where you're, VC, startup founder, or even like trying to find a job, 
the importance of putting yourself out there. The say it again. The importance of putting yourself. Oh, out the importance. There. Okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like I, if you really want something, you got to be willing to try different approaches. You've got to, you got to persevere. You got to persist. Right. And so if you're looking for a job, then you want to reach out to a lot of people. You want to be sending some cold emails, right. Finding who has the positions that you want to have, reach out to them to learn from them, uh, reach out to the companies you want to work with, you know, cold email, find people to make intros. Same thing in the startup world, right? If you want to build a startup and you're trying to raise your first round of funding, you're going to have to email a lot of people and you're probably going to have to send a lot of cold emails unless you already have a massive network uh, and you can just raise money from your friends. Uh, the reality is you're going to have to get out there, put yourself out there, do pitch competitions, go to events, get on podcasts, uh, you know, do whatever, whatever it takes to get the necessary reach and get in front of the right people. Um, it's incredibly important, especially in the early days. Now, I think there's a, uh, there's a balance to this. So like, yeah, you can't network all the time. You gotta, you gotta build exactly. something, right? You gotta build something. I think some people get carried away and that's all they do. The reality is you need to understand uh, what getting yourself out there or putting yourself out there is for, right? So if you're raising capital, you need to put yourself out there so you can meet investors, get in front of investors and close your round. Or if you're trying to hire people, you need to get out there so you can meet the right people unless you're just gonna hire a recruiter. Then you gotta get out there and meet people and yeah. interview people. Um, but when it's time to build, it's time to build. And if you already raise your round and you're going to networking events every single day, because- And it was easy to do here in Seattle. Easy to do. It easy to do here. Gone. Yes. It, it, I've, I've been here. I, I flew in, I believe May 22nd. So I've been here now uh, almost two and a half, uh, but just over two months. And I'm not exaggerating. I've been to, I've been to over 45 startup events, yeah. a startup tech venture innovation events here. It's easy to do in an ecosystem like Seattle. Um, so you can't get carried away. You have to like, you have, any other gaming stuff, you know, going on, you know, stuff from Bellevue here. It's like, yeah. And then it's like there are all these groups here, like Carlos Live, Startup Ground. Yeah. Um, what's his name? Bob Crimmins does a startup. Startup Haven. Haven. Yeah. yeah. You know, it can easily be overwhelmed. But you got, you got to have some discipline, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if you're building a startup, it's not about, you know, it's not about raising capital. It's not about getting publicity or all these things. It's about building something that people love. Right. And that should be your core focus is building a great product. You can make a good point. I think a lot of founders, they miss opportunity to network, like recruit people to come on the team. Right. I mean, maybe you can't hire them right now, but you know, like maybe in a year or so, like I think too many people don't have a talent pool, a talent bench, so to speak. Right. Can you talk about the importance of that having a talent bench? Absolutely. Yeah. Like, um, especially in a startup because they grow so rapidly or they can grow so rapidly. Uh, and when, when it's time to scale, you have to have the right people on board to scale with you. Uh, and so I think you need to build those relationships earlier on. You need to be talking to either recruiters or people that you think would be a great fit that you're ready to hire. Once that next big contract comes in, once that funding comes in, you've got to be having those conversations and building those relationships because oftentimes the best people that you could have, the best candidates that you could have to work at your startup are people that are not going to immediately say yes, that you need to get to know them and that you need to convince them over time. I mean, because pretty hiring, they want to see traction too, right? Exactly. You know, like, yeah, you know, I can just come work for free for six months. I got to see some kind of plan where you're like, money's going to come in, right? Yeah. In a way, it's the same thing as like choosing a startup to invest in, right? Like if a, a top level AI ML engineer is going to join a startup, they're going to do their diligence. They're going to, they're going to vet that company as if it's an investment because it is in a way, right? Yeah. Like they're going to be compensated with stock. If the company does great, that stock is going to one day be worth a lot of money. Uh, and so they're going to vet it in a similar way to how an investor is going to vet a company. And yeah, do the, do the, uh, like you said, you know, is Jason a good guy, bad guy, you know, that kind of stuff, yeah. you know, like, no, you don't work for Jason. He's a jackass. Yeah. The culture you know? fit is even more important yeah. there because you're actually spending the day to day with those people in the early days. So. Yeah. And even if you're remote in a startup, you still spend a lot of time doing meetings and stuff too. Right. I mean, it's not like a nine to five, you know, it's a, yeah. Yeah. So, you have to really be able to get along with those people and be so, on the same page. So next accelerators and incubators, right? So I know you have accelerator. So many questions. Like first, is there a difference between accelerator and incubator? Um, there is actually a lot of people use the words interchangeably. Uh, incubators are more focused on incubating the ideas, which is, you know, generating the ideas, coming up with the ideas. Um, so they're like, in a way it's like pre-accelerated. So different stage startups. Different stage. Okay. Yeah. 
uh, more idea stage. And then accelerators are more focused on accelerating the growth of the company, helping them get their first couple of customers uh, or first 100 customers, helping them raise capital. Um, so yeah, they serve different purposes, but a lot of people use the two words interchangeably. So multi-layer question, like it's me all the place. Like one, like why should a startup even do one of these things, you know, like, and like you hear one, like you're like stories, like they invest like $2,000 for 20% of your company. You know, of course that's probably a bad example, right? I think one out of Austin recently went bankrupt or something, you know, like, and then like, how do you pick a choose which one's the best one for you? And then is the such thing as doing too many of them, right? Like, can you do like accelerate every year? Cause basically all kind of do the same thing, right? Yeah, in a way. And so the way I would look at it is I would vet an accelerator the same way that you would vet an advisor for your company, the same way that you would vet an employee for your company. Um, because at the end of the day, if you're going to be giving somebody equity, they have to be able to bring value. Even if it's a free accelerator, uh, you're going to dedicate a lot of your time to being part of the sessions, whether it's one-on-ones or speaker sessions. And so you really have to do some diligence into what network do they have? Is that network going to be valuable for me? Um, what can this do for our company, right? Can it help us hire the right talent? Can it help us close some contracts? Can it help us raise capital, right? If it can't help you with any of those things, then you should question why you're going to dedicate your time or give up equity. Most to of them, part like, of that. most of them, like anywhere from three months to a year, right? Um, the majority, I would say, are more on like the three month mark. Okay, I think that's like standard, but there's a lot that are a year plus even. Um, but yeah, you you got to do your diligence and you got to do your work. When we were starting our accelerator back when when the pandemic hit, what happened was we were doing all these in person startup events and we had to cancel them immediately overnight because of pandemic everything shut down no in-person events so we said how can we continue to support early stage founders and the only way we came up with was to launch an accelerator which was actually part of our long-term goal our five-year plan was to launch an accelerator but instead we launched it in 10 weeks after the pandemic and so in those early days we you know kind of looking at it from the same uh perspective why would anybody want to join our accelerator right because we're just, you know, these random people in Gainesville, Florida, uh, doing these Zoom sessions, bringing in random speakers, you know, so we had to actually sell people on, we had to find great founders and sell them on why they should join our accelerator. And it was a ton of outreach and setting up calls with people and trying to persuade them, even if it was a free program, they were going to dedicate their time to this, right? And so we actually ended up getting some, some really interesting companies that went through in the early days. Um, and you still doing the accelerator? Uh, the accelerator is actually on hold right now. It's on pause. We're not doing it actively right now. We we are going to bring it back in the future. Uh, the reason that we're not doing it right now is because we're we're focused on other priorities, which is uh, building our firm, building our fund. Uh, we're, so we're in fundraising mode. And then also being able to provide value for our portfolio companies. So in a way, we are doing programming, but a lot of it is more private. It's more internal. It's more for our portfolio companies. And we're doing a lot of the same exact things that we were doing for our accelerator, except we're just doing it for a few, a smaller subset of companies, particularly ones that we are working with and ones that we want to work with. Um, so, yeah. So when you start the accelerator again, is it going to be mainly for like potential companies you're going to invest in that's, that's based on your theses, I mean, agnostic or best company? How's that going to work? I, I, I can't give you an exact answer because we, that's one thing that we need to discuss more and figure out what approach we want to take. But my guess is that we would ultimately maybe grow it a little bit. So start taking more companies per cohort than we used to, and maybe start giving fun, a small amount of funding to every single company that goes through, um, and then take, you know, small amount of equity. So I don't know what those deal terms are going to look like. Um, but, but yeah, we, we do have a plan to bring it back one day. And, uh, we, we think it's going to be a lot more valuable once we do, because a lot of the things that we're doing now is preparing ourselves to better support startups, right? We're building our network. We're doing in-person events. We're bringing in speakers. We're building relationships with other investors. And so when we go to do our accelerator down the line, we're going to have a much larger pool of potential speakers, mentors, advisors, as well as VCs and angels to bring in for our demo days. So, And how do you find like the people, like, I guess, like, like speakers or vendors, how do you make sure you, how do you bring in like qualified people to speak? Because I'm sure when people find you have accelerated, like all these people come out of the woodwork, you know, let me speak about marketing. And they're really just trying like, you know, of course they want to sell stuff to your startups, but like, they're like almost like used car sales me like it. Right. How do you make sure that balance is there? 
Yeah, good question. So the way we did it is by doing our diligence and, and doing some work into the background of the people who we're going to speak and mentor. Um, oftentimes, I mean, we don't really get too many service providers involved. I mean, we'd have usually one or two per cohort, usually a law firm. So like an attorney who's worked with startups previously, who's worked with VC firms. Um, and then sometimes like a tax uh, CPA person, finance person, um, but for the most part, we're getting actually founders, founders that have built massive companies, founders that have had exits, founders that have had a lot of experience and, uh, have learned the hard way have, have been in the trenches. Um, so that's how we would normally vet the speakers. We actually had some pretty amazing speakers. Um, I actually just saw yesterday, exactly two years ago from yesterday, uh, uh, it, this popped up on my LinkedIn or one of my social media platforms. So I saw this, but, um, we had Logan head the, uh, I believe he's a C yeah, CEO, uh, CEO or no CTO co-founder and CTO for whatnot, which is the fastest growing, uh, marketplace, one of the fastest growing marketplaces in history and the fastest growing YC marketplace in history. Um, so yeah, we had him speak. We had Rob Chestnut, the former chief ethics officer of Airbnb. We had Jeff Hoffman, the former uh, CEO of Priceline. We had um, we had a lot of founders. The founder, uh, co-founder of uh, Proctor U, which, which I mentioned, he's a UF alumni. Um, so, yeah, we we did a lot of work to get these speakers. In the beginning, we didn't have a network like that, and we had to do a lot of cold outreach to get these speakers. And we worked really hard to do that. And you so. find these speakers do it because they you know they want to give back. They've made it so to speak. They want to give back. Or why do you think they they're doing this speaking stuff for y'all? Absolutely. Yeah. They, uh, a lot of them have, uh, achieved a certain level of success and it, they enjoy mentoring. They enjoy giving back. Some of them are doing it in some ways selfishly because they're looking for deal flow and they, you know, want to get exposed to different companies and maybe invest in some, but the majority were just do, willing to do it as a favor because they wanted to support us or because they wanted to help other founders. So, yeah. so you, you might not know this answer, but why is valuation different in different cities? Like, you might get a five million dollars in Seattle. It might be twelve million in San Francisco. It might be nine million somewhere else. Like the companies are the same. Just like is like because the economics are different. The location or money deal um, is that available money there. Like what is it? Yes, the economics are different for different locations. So when you look at an ecosystem like Seattle, Seattle is a very expensive place to live, and it's very expensive to hire technical talent here because you've got all of these massive companies that are willing to pay really well. Such startups as, for maybe low money and like may, maybe some stock or big ass corporation like 300,000 a year. Exactly. It's, it's an easy choice. Exactly. And a lot of people here have, they have what's called the, the golden handcuffs, right? So oh, yeah, yeah. They have a very yeah. cushiony, <laughs> comfortable salary. And it's very hard to, to give that up. And if I just stay two more years, I get all these stock options go yeah. on in and I can retire, never work in my life. Yeah, exactly. Or maybe not that much, but like still like be very comfortable. So like a lot of these people are not willing to leave unless you make them an insane offer, which as a startup, it would be stupid to pay somebody, you know, more than what these other companies are paying them yeah. because you don't have the, the amount of resources. So, so this is one reason the talent is more expensive. The uh, cost of living is more expensive. So that just means that you need to raise more money because to build the same exact startup is going to cost you more in this different ecosystem. Now, the other thing is that your valuation is always what the market is willing to give you, right? It's not just like, oh, we're going to raise that $50 million valuation. You can't just say <laughs> that. Um, it's whatever the market is willing to give you. And so if you're in Silicon Valley, where you have more than 60 venture capital firms headquartered within a five mile radius of Stanford, then you can get a higher valuation because the firms are competing against each other right? If they give you a $2 million valuation and you have like some notable traction, they're going to be like, screw that. Like I'm going to take this other offer at 10 million, you know, but when you're in Gainesville, Florida, where there are no venture capital firms or there were none, you know, five, 10 years ago, and some angel investor says, I'm going to put $50,000 into your company at a $1 million valuation. You're going to take that money. It doesn't matter because you have no other choices. You have no other options unless you're doing a lot of cold outreach, right? And reaching out to other firms and other ecosystems, uh, which is usually harder to, to get a hold of. Uh, so yeah, it depends on market. And then it also depends on other factors like the economics.
So you know, all the stats out there show you know, you know, most people, most people get invested like they're like look like me, like white guys, and like you know, non-white people have no investment money, right? So do you do you find like pressure to invest in like I said, non-white people versus white people? Do you find like like do you find like you no know, minorities like reach out to you for investment, even though their thesis isn't the same what you need, right? That's a good question. Um, I I do think just the nature of the the space, there's a lot less minorities than there are. Like there's a lot less Latino founders than there are white founders. There's a lot less female founders than there are male founders, right? And so it, it's very difficult if you want to say like, I'm going to invest in only, you know, underrepresented. It's very difficult. That's what I was like, underrepresented. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, underrepresented. So um, I, I do think that um, as investors and as, anybody, if you run an accelerator, if you run a venture fund, um, you have a responsibility to help equal the playing field in some capacity. Um, but I also understand that it's not, it's not super easy. It's not something you can do overnight because the demographics are not there yet. Right. So I, I think, um, I think everybody can play their part and they, they can do, they can do their, they can play their role, but, uh, um, it's not easy to, if you're going to, if you want to invest in high quality deals, it's not like, you can immediately find all these good deals that are like led by underrepresented founders. They're out there. You can find them. It's going to be a lot more work. Uh, and I think some of that work is worth being done. And I think there's a lot of great firms that have focused on that. Right. Um, our firm, our firm specifically, we're not investing in only uh, underrepresented founders. Now we do, we do have like a, uh, a particular interest in backing underrepresented founders but we don't have like a set percentage or amount that we commit to. Um, I think long-term we want to, you know, get more clear about exactly what, how much we want to do in that space, but, um, or how many, you know, what, what percentage of underrepresented founders we want to back. Um, but right now we're, we're backing a combination, you know, of. So when underrepresented founder comes to you with like, you no, know, their idea or their deck, whatever, and it's not a fair, you're not in your thesis. You like, you take the time, like, you no, know, like connect with someone else. You take, Hey, I want to invest you, but I want to admit to you, like, how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I personally will always go out of my way to support, you know, an underrepresented founder, even if it's not a fit for our fund or not a deal that we're particularly interested in, I will always try to be supportive and, and help. And one thing that's been helpful is being part of Miami's tech ecosystem too, because there's so much diversity there and there are so many Latino founders there. And there's actually a lot of female founders there too. Uh, and so it's been a good ecosystem to, to be able to meet a lot of underrepresented founders and help them in some capacity or be involved in some capacity. So, uh, so yeah, I always try to, to be helpful however I can. So how does, how, how do you, does this work? So this has always been like one of my pet peeves, right? People say, go to friends and family, right? Most people don't have friends and family like that, right? Like I don't have like some random uncle I asked for $300,000, right? So like you tell underrepresented people or founders, like go do a family and friends, right? Like, they're probably like, I am the family friend, right? So how how's that? How do you overcome that? Just a part of the game they got to play, so to speak. Yeah, it's that's a that's a great point. Um, yeah, when you when it's it's almost like offensive if you're going to tell like a you know an immigrant or a uh, underrepresented founder who doesn't have a huge network to go raise a friends and family round because they don't have that, right? They're not uh, somebody who has like a rich uncle that they can just call up whenever and be like, hey, can you put quarter million into my startup or whatever, like. You know, we don't all have a rich uncle. So I think um, I think that's something that you have to, as an as an underrepresented founder who's trying to break in and trying to raise that first round, you're going to have to work harder than than the other people. You're going to have to. There's no shortcut there. So instead of doing 100 emails, you probably get you have probably 200 emails. Yeah, or 500 emails, right? Um, and so, but th that doesn't mean that it's not worth it. That doesn't mean that you should give up. It, it just means that you're going to have to do more work. And you know, it's a bigger payoff in the long term because, you know, when you come from less, I think, uh, and you're able to accomplish, you know, a certain level of, of success, then you can come back and actually mentor and give back and support others. Right. So I definitely think that, um, it's, it, it's not easy, right. There's no easy answer there, but like, I think, um, you just have to put in the work. Yeah. I wish I could remember the, the name of this DC firm that did this. Or the, well, I probably won't say his name, but anybody remember, but I remember he like he he did put on social media like you know our VC firm wants to do more diverse like investing blah 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 all that kind of stuff. On the website it said we only do deals with people who already know. 
Like what? Like, so that does not match at all. There's a lot of firms that only invest in founders that they get, get inbound through a warm intro. Yeah. Uh, and then some of them may even say that only founders that they already know. Mm -hmm. Right. So are you trying to like do diverse investing and all your investment with white people or like how many diverse people do you really know? Yeah. The way I look at it is I think underrepresented founders have an advantage. They oh, have yeah, an advantage yeah. because they have a chip on their shoulder. They have something to prove. They don't come from wealth. They don't come from a background where they had a bunch of business mentors and startup gurus to teach them everything. They had to learn the hard way. Right. And when you have to learn the hard way, you develop grit, you develop a really strong work ethic. You develop um, a long-term vision and doing things the right way instead of taking shortcuts, right? And so I think a lot of these underrepresented founders, because of their uh, background and the past and what they've had to overcome, they're positioned to be able to achieve a very high level of success, you know? Uh, so I think that ultimately, I, I, I don't think it's that serious because I think those venture firms that are saying, we are not going to back anybody outside of our network they're missing out. Yeah. They're loss, right? There's going to be a lot of immigrant founders, Latino founders, female founders, black founders that are going to go on and build really successful startups. And a lot of these venture funds that missed out because you had to get in through their network are going to miss out. Right. And then they're going to realize that, you know, they're, they're missing out on a lot of opportunity. Uh, and meanwhile, you know, you're going to have other fund managers and angels that are willing to back those people that are going to make great returns and then can go back and invest in more and support more. So I think, um, I think progress is being made. I think it's slow, but I think, um, I think over time things will start to level off a little bit more. So how do y'all do this? Like suppose three companies come to you, like the startups, all the big same level, they're doing the same thing. Everything pretty much the same, right? Traction, the level of founders, the same skill level. How do you go about deciding? You can only invest in one. Like how do you go about deciding that? Um, that's a good question. So ultimately, because we're investing at the pre-seed stage, it's all about the founding team. And so we would spend a lot of time getting to know the founders. Um, we're not going to say like, oh, this founder is Latino. We're going to invest in that one, right? We need to get to know the founders. We need to understand, you know, what are their stories? Why are they building what they're building? Do they have a high level of grit? Are they willing to operate and work in a capital efficient environment? Um, are they resourceful? Can they do a lot with a little, right? So these are the things that we're going to look for. And we're not going to make a decision based off, you know, this person's skin color or this person's, um, you know, um, whatever it is, wh whatever background they come from. We're going to make a decision based on who we believe has the highest merit or who, who, who has the highest potential to build that particular startup. Um, so, yeah. And so y'all invest like government startups, right? That do government work. Government tech. Government yes. tech, right. And so how does the SBIR process play what y'all do? Like if a tech startup came to, I don't have an SBIR, SBIR would order them, does that give them a legs up on you? Or like you have to do the SBIR? Yeah, so we we don't typically get too involved in helping them with the SBIRs. Um, we have other resources that we can point them to that could help them a little bit more with that. Um, but this is a really good way for gov tech startups to get uh, non-dilutive funding. And a lot of our portfolio companies have gotten uh, SIBRs or SBIRs. Um, so I, I think it's, um, it's, it's a great opportunity. I think it's great that the government is doing this. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's complimentary. It's not competitive in any way with what we're doing because it's non-diluted funding. So it's not like the cap table is getting messed up. It's not like we're being diluted in any way. Um, it's just giving them more runway. It's giving them more resources to build or to optimize product. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of our portfolio companies have gotten the Sibbers and it's been really helpful. So if you're, for your firm, you're in Miami, is, is it Chris or Christopher? Uh, Christopher. Yeah. Christopher's in Seattle. Yeah. How does that even work? Like it, it, it's like talking about remote, like you're the opposite side of the country, right? How does that work? It's like, like doing part, like doing deal flow, like doing the whole like dying thing. I mean, y'all take remote work to the extreme, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think it's actually complementary in some ways because um, we're able to tap into different ecosystems. I see so much opportunity in Seattle's ecosystem, and I want to be a part of it, like for forever, like not just like one year, or two years. Like I, we will always have some type of presence in Seattle because I see the the level of talent here, and I I think that there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, so 
given that I'm going to be back in Florida for nine months of the year, Christopher can be here in Seattle and still work this ecosystem, right? And as a new firm, this is very beneficial for us because we're able to have a bigger reach. We're able to get deal flow from different ecosystems. We're able to have a bigger presence. We're able to find investors, mentors, and advisors for our companies in different ecosystems. Um, and so, and we talk very frequently. I mean, we're, that's the thing about our firm is, is we're very, we're very lean team. It's just three of us. So Christopher is our venture partner. We brought him on about nine months ago. Uh, and then it's me and, and my co-founder and, and uh, co-managing partner, uh, Justice, who's in Cleveland. And between the three of us, you know, we can work different ecosystems and, but we're, we're all very close friends. And so uh, that definitely helps. we're all on the same page. We have the same, we have a similar vision. And so we actually talk very frequently. So we're usually, regardless of whether we're in the same city or not, we're usually having uh, sometimes multiple calls in one day. Um, but definitely at the very least, you know, multiple calls per week. And if you can't answer this question, that's understandable. But when someone comes to you and I try to get money from y'all, do all three of y'all have to agree? Is like to be has to be a unanimous choice? Is two to one, or does one person say oh, we're going to invest in this company? Or is it like unanimous? So it is, um, it's unanimous, but it's between uh, two of us. So between Justice and I, so okay. we're the ones making the final investment decisions, uh, and it has to be unanimous. And so the way we look at it, and we learned this from one of our mentors, who's also one of our investors in our fund, um, Darren Cook. He built, uh, he was a co-founder of uh, Infinite Energy which uh, was the largest natural gas retailer and supplier in Florida. They actually scaled the company to $600 million in revenue a year. And then they sold it to Gas South, which is now the largest in the Southeast United States. Um, and Darren Cook told us when him and his co-founder, Rich Blazer, were, bu were building Infinite Energy, that any time that they had to make a tough decision, no counts as two, as two answers, as two votes. Uh, and so the idea is that the person who believes in this or the person who thinks that we should do this needs to be able to convince the other person that this is a good idea or that this is a good decision or that this is a good investment we want to make. And so no counts as two votes. Yes, counts as one. So it's in a way it's unanimous. Yeah. And that's interesting. Interesting. That's an interesting concept. Vote no is two. Yeah. I actually like that. Yeah. So you know, of course raising money is hard for founders, right? And I've never raised money as a VC firm, but I have to imagine it's a million times harder for a VC firm to raise funds, right? Because like, like me, I can go to VC firms. I'm sure the pool of people with like billions of dollars or the money needed for your fund has to be way, way smaller. Can you talk about the challenges of raising a fund? Absolutely. It is an incredible grind. It is, it's as a start, you, you, hit, you hit the nail on the head. As a startup, you go to VCs and you go to angels to raise capital. But as a VC, you raise capital from LPs, which is limited partners, which is, it could be anybody, right? It could be friends and family, but it could be uh, a lawyer. It could be a startup founder. It could be uh, another VC. It could be anybody, really. So, um, so what happens is that you have such a big pool of people, and then you have to kind of figure out, you can't just try to go after everybody because at the end of the day, the majority of people are going to tell you no. So uh, you have to narrow in on an approach. And so... So yeah, I think um, in the early days, that's what we try to do is try to go after everybody. And it was a huge grind. Uh, and then now we have a strategy that's working. So the majority of the LPs in our fund are actually University of Florida alumni. And because they see the opportunity, the same opportunity that we see, we're the only venture fund based in Gainesville, Florida. We're the only venture capital firm actively running programs on a consistent basis at the University of Florida. And these people that we're talking to who are also UF alumni that have gone on to, to accomplish remarkable things. They're like, yes, there's a lot more people like me. There's a lot more people that will go and graduate from UF and will go and build big startups and are going to achieve, you know, very high valuations and big exits. So why don't we invest in them? Right. Why don't we help support them? And then, you know, take part on some of the profits as well. So, so yeah, you really have to find a strategy that works um, but I think that's the, the biggest fundamental difference is that VCs have a much broader pool of who they're raising money from, which can be a plus, but it can also be a negative because you don't know who to go after. And these LPs, other people raise money, are they like invested in anything? Are they like, are they like have their own thesis, right? Like, like John Bob might only invest in AI, you know, Mary Smith only invest in like, you know, HR tech. 
Oh, they just they have a great opportunity to invest a great opportunity. Yeah. So it's it's interesting because there's so going back to the idea that LPs could be anybody, there's a lot of LPs in our fund that have never invested in a venture fund before. So some of them, they're investing in you. They're investing in the fund manager. They're investing in the GPs, the, the people, which is not too dissimilar from investing in an early startup, right? Um, and then there's others that have that are more experienced that have made fund investments and have their own thesis around what they look for in a fund, right? So some of them are like, we've talked to some that are like geographically focused, right? They want to have, you know, one person, uh, they want to have multiple funds in like the West coast and maybe some in like the Midwest and some in Southeast um, and others have like certain regions that they're particularly interested in. Uh, others have like more of like a thesis around what types of companies they want those funds to be backing. So um, yeah, it just varies. And again, LPs are so broad that every single LP has something different that they're looking for. Now, when someone invests in you, do you have like another like a like a regular basis? Give them an update. Like you have to you have to like prove like what you're doing. Like you have to show, hey, I invested I invested money in ten companies. Eight didn't make it. Two two made it. Here's a return. I can't show like ten percent, twenty percent return. How's that all work? Yeah, it's not so much straightforward like that because again, going back to the idea that startups building a startup is a long journey and the average exit takes seven to ten years. So we're sending updates on a quarterly basis. And in these updates, we're including things like new portfolio companies, so new investments that we've made, progress uh, and traction with our previous portfolio companies and updates. Um, and then we also include a little bit about our personal lives as well, um, because you know we we have a good relationship with all of our LPs, and um, a lot of them are you know we would consider them personal friends, um, and so we want to give them a little bit of like a viewpoint on our on our lives and some of the things that we're doing. Um, but, but yeah, so yeah, the updates go over. The, we're not, we're not tell, telling them about like the multiples, like how much your money's worth, because that would be a nightmare to calculate every single quarter and it's fluctuating so much. And so it, you can't really, I mean, it, it would be, it, most funds don't do that. Um, but yeah, we're more giving them updates about the portfolio companies and what's going on. So how does this work? Like, like, well, you found a company you want to invest in, right? You have to go and like tell the LP beforehand or bring back questions. Like, has there happened where like you invest in a company, right? And you get an update and the person came back and say, you know what? I don't want to invest in that type of company. Like, because of either, like, you know, cultural reasons or political beliefs or really belief, or you know, like, has that ever happened? No, because you need to set the expectation up up front. So when we take a new LP into our fund, we make it very clear up front that they're not going to be partaking in the decision-making okay. of the investments that me and my co-founder and partner justice are going to be making all the decisions around which portfolio companies we want to invest in. So you have to set that, you have to set that up, up front, the expectation up, up front. Uh, what if somebody said like, um, I'll make this up. Oh yeah. Someone for $10 million. And I say, well, I'll give you a hundred million dollars, but I won't be involved in the decision-making process. We have had similar, maybe not at that scale, but we've had similar situations previously. We've had somebody, you know, offer us a big sum of money and somebody that we actually have a lot of respect for and is a great person. Um, and we have made, we have turned that down. So that's your like a, I won't call it a red line in the sand, but basically like your line in the sand, so to speak. Yeah. Here's the thing. Like uh, we're taking the hard path. We're building our own firm. We're, we're doing the hard work and to go this route to go back to having what I would consider or in a way like having a boss, yeah, right? It would be a boss. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, 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 I'm a horrible employee. Like this is why I never wanted to work for somebody else and why I haven't worked for anybody else since my college internship. Right. So I, the last thing that I want as we're making progress and building our firm is to go back to having a boss. Yeah. Right. And me and my partner, justice, we, we met at the university of Florida um, back in 2016. And we were, we be, instantly became best friends. We were friends long before we started our accelerator, long before we started our firm. And so we aligned very well on a lot of things. Like in one way, like we're at the same exact stage in life. Uh, we have a very similar vision for what we want to build. Uh, we're both 28 years old and, um, and yeah, we're, we're really on the same page. If we were to bring somebody in that has a large amount of wealth and is going to put a lot of money in, but wants to be part of the decision-making process, 
that could get uh, really sloppy and messy in, in a lot of ways. It's almost like a startup, you know, bringing someone for $100 million and they give the, the rich guy like 75% of the company, right? Yeah, it's the whole idea that, um, uh, I don't know if you've heard this quote or analogy, but uh, it's the, the analogy of like raising capital where like uh, you pick up a hitchhiker. It, it's, it's like picking up a hitchhiker, handing them the keys, uh, or, or they take the keys of the car and then they kick you out of your own car. Yeah. Right. I've heard that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's similar. And I, you know, eventually as we grow as a firm, we're definitely going to bring on more partners without a doubt. Um, as we, as we grow, we're going to need to bring on more partners and we're going to need to bring, bring on people that have other strengths that justice and I don't have. Um, but we're not there yet. We're like in the, to put it, to, to compare it to a startup, we're in the, you know, the seed stage of a startup. I guess you could say. From your point of view and your perspective, what makes someone like a, a great, a good or even great venture person? I think a very high sense of curiosity. I think uh, as a venture capitalist, you're constantly being exposed to new industries and you have to have the curiosity to want to dive deeper and to learn more, right? You have to have the people skills to be able to get out there, network, and uh, and connect with founders, right? And build those relationships with founders. Um, and um, I think you have to be able to work really, really hard. Um, I think there's this, this whole um, perspective on venture capital that VCs are just these, uh, you know, rich people that have made it and they want to sit back on the yacht and make investments and they don't work very hard. And this is actually true for a part of the industry. There's there's a lot of VCs that maybe live this lifestyle and don't work very hard. And then it's no surprise that half of all venture capital firms lose money or don't make any money, you know? So if you want to be in, a in the top quartile, the top 25% of funds, which are typically making, you know, somewhere around three to five X uh, returns over a 10 year period, um, you have to work really, really hard and you have to find ways to add value to your portfolio companies. You have to find ways to get deal flow that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise that other firms are not seeing. You have to do things differently and you have to work really hard to, to accomplish that. So when you became a VC, do you have to take any kind of accreditation test, any kind of tests, or just you just said, I'm a VC, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, I wish it was that easy to just say like, I'm a VC, hey, uh, invest in my fund. But the reality is that um, there are no accreditations that you have to go through or licenses that you need, but there's a lot of things that you need to learn. And we took that process very seriously. We read a ton of books. We listened to a ton of podcasts. We did a lot of programs. We did three different programs for emerging fund managers, including the VC lab program by Founder Institute, which was actually recommended to us by uh, Bob Crimmins from Startup Haven. Um, and we did the Sutton Capital accelerator program for emerging fund managers. Uh, they're based in New York. Uh, and then we did uh, the UC Berkeley uh, program through the UC Berkeley Law School um, called uh, Venture Capital University, uh, which is the only program accredited under the National Venture Capital Association. And um, again, it was all in the name of learning and preparing ourselves, because if we're going to be managing somebody's money, we better be well prepared and we better be confident that we can get them a good return. And so those were some of the things that we did to prepare ourselves, but arguably the most valuable thing that we did to prepare ourselves is we actually went out and reached out cold to other uh, GPs that established funds to interview them. And we actually interviewed over 60 VC fund managers and GPs. So quick question, are the people you reached out to, what percentage said, yes, I'll talk to you? Um, I don't know the percentage, honestly. But we reached out to so high. many. Uh, was it a high percentage or low percentage? It was probably somewhere around like 30, okay. maybe like 20 to 30%. I mean, if you compare the open email rates, that's a pretty good percentage. That is a pretty good percentage. And it's because, you know, we weren't really asking for anything crazy. We're not asking them to invest. We're just asking them, hey, we want to learn from you. And so we were able to talk with uh, like people who are incredibly successful. We actually, I, I spoke with Gary Tan, actually, who's now the president or, the YC, right? or CEO, president, y, y, yeah, Y Combinator. Okay. Uh, I spoke with Tim Young from ENIAC Ventures. They backed like, I believe, like 13 unicorns or uh, more. And um, we spoke with, actually, I spoke with a local VC here in Seattle, which I recently met for the first time in person. So Timothy Chen okay. with Essence VC. Yeah, he was, uh, the, he was the, on the, the AI thing with you, right? 
He was, yeah, yeah about exactly. Like Drone Adventures did that AI thing. Yeah, he, yeah, he was there. Uh, so he just raised, I believe it's his second or third fund. I think it was third fund, 27 million. It was just announced uh, like two weeks ago. Um, and anyways, we spoke with him like, again, two years ago when we were first starting our fundraising process and it was super helpful, you know? So like, there were so many people that like, like that, that we just reached out to, we're like, we just want to learn from you. And they gave us some time. And over time, you know, we started to see common patterns, common notes, and then also you get a lot of conflicting advice too. Oh my God. You get so much conflicting oh advice. It's, and it's ridiculous. so over time, we started to refine our yeah. own thesis, yeah. our own vision for what we were building, because we realized that there's not one size fits all. There's not one yeah. vision. Everyone has their own journey. You know, what, what works for, like what, what works for you might not work for me, you know, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. And I think one thing that's really helped us as emerging fund managers is breaking into the industry from a untraditional means, right? So coming from an untraditional background. So there's a, the majority of VCs, or not the majority, but I think, uh, I, I would say, actually, I think the majority of VCs uh, came from a background of starting a, a startup and then exiting and then getting into VC, right? Um, but coming from an outside perspective uh, kind of gives us this... Uh, a different way of looking at things. And we're willing to try things that maybe other VCs are not willing to try. We're willing to do things that other VCs are not willing to do. Um, we probably put on more events than any VC firm of our size. Any VC firm that's on fund one that uh, has two founding partners, two GPs, and that's it. Um, I, I guarantee the majority of them are not putting on as many events as we're doing. And the thing is, and even, and even a lot of larger firms are not doing events. And the thing is, it's a lot of work. Oh, yeah. It's a ton of work. It takes money. It takes time. And the logistics of rent just by itself. Yeah. But, if, you know, for us, the way we look at things is everything that we can do in the name of supporting our portfolio companies and getting access to quality deal flow, right? And so this is what led us down this path. And also, by the way, uh, VC firms, the way they make money in the short term is off a 2% management fee on the AUM. And so we've just deployed our first million dollars. And so 2% off of that is not a lot to be able to pay the bills and yeah. pay expenses and pay for events. And so we've had to get creative to... I mean, you, you all are basically startup founders. You think about it, right? Exactly. We're basically like bootstrap startup founders with, with very limited capital and we have to be resourceful. We're forced to. And so no, so... no, no private just yet. <laughs> <laughs> So what we had to ask ourselves is how can we support our portfolio companies, build our brand and get quality deal flow and generate rent revenue, right? Generate income in the short term. And there's a few things that came to mind, right? And one of the top ones was doing events. And so that was actually part of our origin story was doing events back in Gainesville, you know, seven years ago. And so it, it was a very natural transition for us to go back to that. To doing in-person events and that's one of the reasons that our accelerator is on hold right now but we have been getting such a great benefit from doing these events both on the deal flow side fundraising side and also on you know the, generating the, some revenue. The branding stuff too and the branding yeah. absolutely so with the three of y'all do you have like an office manager or a virtual assistant have to like do all like things i'll call the unsexy work you know like bookkeeping and scheduling stuff or is this all y'all three handle all that too no yeah we're we have no office manager we we're doing we we do we have been working with Carta um, for the past uh, two years since we were getting started with our with our fund. Um, so they were doing kind of like our fund admin and back end. Uh, but now uh, Carta is just they're just too expensive for a fund as small as us. Yeah. So we're transitioning to another uh, fund admin uh, platform. Um, but but yeah, so we're, we're not doing everything, but we're doing a lot. You know, we're doing the majority of of everything so which is kind of like an early startup in a way you're yeah. kind of doing everything and how many startups have you actually invested in so far we have now made 10 investments so those 10 is there anyone the company you want to like talk about anyone's companies that you want to talk about or can't talk about or what, or what they're doing yeah no i would love to talk about some of them yeah so um any particular no. i guess like just yeah, whatever you want to do all right um yeah, yeah. you can talk about all 10 of them if you want to it's totally up to you yeah so I'll, I'll highlight a few of them. So um, our first investment was in a company called EaseAlert. And Blake Richardson, the founder of EaseAlert, his father was a firefighter for over a decade. 
And his father would come home stressed all the time. And he said, got to do something about this. Firefighting is a stressful job, but it doesn't have to be this stressful. And so started doing some digging. Anyways, he came up with this product, Ease Alert, which is a smart wearable device that gives a gentle vibration one to two minutes before the alarms go off at the station, before the tones go off uh, to help ease firefighters into the emergency. So a lot of people don't know this, but the leading cause of death in the line of duty for firefighters is actually a heart attack. And they're actually 14 times, 14.1 times more likely to have a heart attack when the tones are going off at the station. So when you really sit back and think about this, more firefighters are dying, are being killed by the alerting method being used than smoke and fire. Like this is crazy. So this is what Easler is solving. And they built a wearable device. It's patented. Patent says for first responders. So they're starting with firefighters, but ultimately they're going to expand to potentially EMTs, police, SWAT, special forces, maybe military. So there's a lot of different use cases there. Um, so yeah, Ease Alert is one of them. Uh, they are now working with the McDill Air Force Base in Tampa and the fire department there. So uh, another one, I'll highlight our most recent investment. So it's called the uh, Holocron Technologies. And uh, basically what they're doing is they're using AI to trace and track science and technology developments on a global landscape. Uh, they, the founder was ex-national security at the White House and the Department of Defense is actually, they actually put out a statement about six months ago or eight months ago that they're looking for technologies to help them keep track of different technology and science developments on a global landscape. Um, and so this is what they're doing. And the, they just raised a pre-seed round, 1.5 million. We were the last money in the round. The round was co-led by New North Ventures, which they're ex-CIA operations officers and Winklevoss Capital, which for those of you who don't know, um, the Winklevoss twins were co-founders of Facebook in the early days. So um, so yeah, that's uh, our, one of our most recent investments. And then I'll highlight um, one other one. So Area, Area has built a platform that allows college campuses and transport hubs to track the flow of traffic using nothing but smartphones and Wi-Fi access points. So without any hardware at all, IT and security teams can have a heat map that shows patterns and shows the flow of traffic on a daily basis, you know, minute by minute uh, in real time. And so the main use cases are for emergency response planning and resource optimization. And uh, we invested in their pre-seed round when they were actually still pre-product and that company uh, actually just closed a, they did a pilot with the MTA in New York city, which is the largest transit hub in the country. And now the MTA actually just moved forward with a full contract. And so you just got a three-year contract with the MTA. Um, and now they're about to start raising their seed round. So a very so. exciting stuff for companies you're working with. Very exciting. Yeah. So like, of course, you know, don't tell me the details, but the companies you have coming up, right? Like, are they, are they like government tech, um, SAS, like what's the, what's the portfolio of companies you're looking at? Yeah. So we invest at the pre-seed stage and we invest in enterprise software and government tech startups. Particularly, we're interested in dual use tech. So this is startups that can sell to both government and enterprise. So the reason that we're interested in this- Is space, that a pretty narrow niche? It is. It is. And we're not exclusive to that. Anything that's enterprise software or government tech can qualify, but we're really interested in the dual use okay. too. And the particular reason for that is, you know, if you were building an enterprise software company about three years ago, anybody, I mean, you could have raised money from anybody. I mean, you could have gotten up to hundred K or 1 million ARR, you know, relatively easily. And the times have changed, right? We're in a different market today. Enterprises are cutting spend. They're laying people off. And it's no longer as easy as it was to close them for a contract. Uh, whereas government, I mean, if you're selling to Department of Defense, they're throwing money around right now, right? They're they're investing pretty heavily right now. So I think um, for us, this is a hedge, right? If we're doing both, it's a way of uh, diversifying in a way. And, and then for dual use tech, if we're investing in dual use, those companies have a larger TAM and they're more recession proof. 
because if the enterprise side is struggling, well, they got the government side. If the government side is not picking up, they got the enterprise that's, side. That's smart. Yeah. So of your 10 companies, what do you expect out of the founders? Like you expect monthly updates? Like what, what are their, are you getting any requirements they have to give to you and your team? Or like, how's that work? We don't expect monthly updates. We expect quarterly updates uh, by email. Uh, but we actually are pretty hands-on with our portfolio founders. So uh, going back to the thing of, uh, going back to the idea of like coming into venture capital from an untraditional background, you know, one of the things that we do that very few VC firms do is we actually do a monthly call with all of our portfolio founders in order to keep track of progress, but also see what they're struggling with and how they can be helpful. So um, obviously not all of them opt into that. We give them the option, but some of them choose not to. Um, but again, the whole idea is we're really hands-on. And so we're constantly speaking with our portfolio companies, seeing how we can help. Um, but the biggest thing that we expect from them is, um, uh, to give us quarterly updates and to be obsessed with what they're building. How do you convince a founder to give you bad news? But no one else wants to give them bad news, especially someone who gave them a lot of money. So how do you convince them to give you the bad news when, they, when something goes wrong? Well, you don't really convince them. It's all about the relationship. And so if you have a relationship that uh, they know they can trust you and they know if they come to you with difficult news that you're going to respond in a way of uh, problem solving versus judging and uh, reprimanding or disciplining, um, then I think that you'll have that, that trust where they're going to want to come to you. Um, sorry, give me a second. Sneeze. No worries. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I think you really need to build that relationship with the founders and build that trust, right? And that's one thing that we've worked at really hard, uh, especially as emerging fund managers. And that's part of the reason that we do the monthly calls because that way, whenever there's crazy uh, or... I guess like what normally would be a crazy news update or bad news, it's not as big of a surprise mm -hmm. because we just talked to them a couple of weeks ago and we saw this thing was coming, right? So um, again, you want to build that trust so that they can come to you in those tough times. The other thing is like, we don't invest in companies to tell them how to run their companies. Me and my partner, Justice, we never built a unicorn startup. We're not going to go out there and tell anybody how to build a unicorn startup. We want to find people that have a vision and know which direction they want to take the company. And we're going to believe in them, right? We're investing in the founding team. And so we're not going to try to tell them what direction to take it. We might say, have you thought about this approach or have you talked to this person, but we're never going to say you should do X or you need to do Y, right? Unless they come to us asking for our perspective or our advice, we're not going to try to tell them what to do. We're not going to try to give them advice. Um, we're going to try to point them in the right direction. And, you know, if we have concerns, we're going to ask questions. We're going to say, hey, I am concerned about X, Y, and Z. Do you see that the same way? Uh, and this is something that I actually picked up and learned from uh, Roloff Bata uh, from Sequoia. Um, and he, he said that that's kind of how he approaches it and how they approach it at Sequoia. Um, so again, we're trying to learn from the best and we're trying to do things differently at the same time. And, um, ultimately it's all in the name of what is in the best interest of the company. And usually that's not us telling the founders what to do. So I'm sure this will never happen, but let's suppose like you invest in a company, right? You do the due diligence, everything worked out good. The founders are great people, whatever, but. Six months in, something came out of the news, or something came out of this, some kind of skeleton bone kind of was caused it. And like, you're like, if I'd have known this, I would never invest in this person. What, what happens then? That's a great question. Um, so even if you do a, a thorough diligence process, there are some things that can change. And there are some things that can come up later on, right? If you're spending five years or an extended period of time, you know, nine months, two years, three years, whatever it is, working with a founder and getting to know them, there's different things that are going to come up that maybe didn't come up during your one to two months of diligence on that startup before you invested. And so when these things happen, it's, you have to kind of go back to your, your, uh, look back on the core reason. Why did you make that investment? Right. And so for us, 
we we have had situations where it's like yes uh so maybe something like we didn't expect maybe like uh there wasn't there there the the um the runway is running out or uh cash maybe, in the bank is or, low or maybe they have like two bank accounts two lines of credit that are maxed out they didn't tell you about not so much those things because those things you sh you should be able to verify okay. uh ahead of time but more so like um maybe the burn rate picks up and maybe um maybe they weren't able to fundraise because the you know market shifted mm -hmm. and so we've actually had that that happen and it's it's scary but then you go back and you say why did we make that investment well we believe in that person right so what is the best thing we can do in the situation well they're running out of capital let's help them fundraise let's help them get more capitalized if we truly believe in that founder and their vision and what they're building and the market opportunity for what they're building then let's help them get some more runway if we can right and so we actually had a situation similar to this so there's an investment that we made in march of last year march of 2022 and in march of 2023 we had a call with the founder and he told us that um well i've got uh one month of runway left <laughs> and this is one of the founders that we don't have the monthly updates with uh monthly calls with because they chose not to opt into them but again we believe in that founder we believe in what he's doing and he told us by the way he just closed a really great pilot at that moment so he's got some good traction but cash is running out and so we said all right we're going to do whatever we can to help i knowing the power of cold outreach because this is how we've built our firm this is how we built our accelerator through cold outreach i go on linkedin and i start finding people that went to the same university as this founder because they have something in common right that could be a potential investor so executives at companies founders who have had exits and i start doing cold outreach i'm like hey by the way so and so. So founder. when you say outreach, you mean cold email or cold calling or combination? Cold message on LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah. The coldest, some... the coldest of the cold. <laughs> yeah, the coldest <laughs> of the cold. Exactly. So I reach out to this one person who built uh, or who has been the CEO of like a large recruiting company for uh, a long time. Well, they've been with the company for twenty years now, or plus twenty plus years, and they are now the CEO. They've been the CEO for I think like a decade, and. They went to the same university as our portfolio founder and i reached out and i said hey um one of our founders also went to this school would you be open to getting on a call with them and mentoring them he replied the person replies the next day and they said sure here's my email and so i approached it from like yes mentor him but i knew this person was qualified to invest because of their position so i i connect them a week later, they get on a call. This person commits on the first call to investing $200,000. <laughs> the founder called me after that call. He's like, Pablo, you don't know what you did for us. He's like, the person that you connected us to just committed to investing $200,000 into the company. Two weeks later, they closed. Mm -hmm. And so that gave them, you know, several months more of runway and now they've been able to raise more capital and now they just close a really big contract and they're they're doing great. And so the way I look at it is like founders oftentimes as, as an investor, oftentimes the biggest value you can add is in these inflection moments or inflection points or uh, Sequoia calls them crucible moments or just really challenging times uh, where the founder really needs some assistance. And oftentimes it's, by making an introduction or, you know, using your reach to be able to support them. Right. So like I constantly am trying to use my LinkedIn network to help our portfolio companies. And sometimes some of them are trying to hire somebody and we'll make a post about it and, you know, whatever else, but, but yeah, I think, um, I think that's, you know, one, one of the ways that you could really make a difference for a portfolio company in a way, you know, uh, or that's one of the ways that you could really help a portfolio company uh, without, you know, telling them what to do in a way. So how about this one? Suppose you have a portfolio company, right? And again, I'm, I'm getting to this whenever it happened. But they're like, all the, all, the tea leaves say this company is going to fare right. Like the traction is bad. Stuff is going bad. There's no, like it'll take a miracle for them to make it right. When you say, hey, start a founder, we might need to think about shutting this down and, and having you do something else. 
So or was that basically a founder, the founder decision and you just stopped to support him? That's a good question. And so I am not qualified to answer that because I haven't had that yet. I haven't had to deal with that yet. I'm going to, at some point, um, I believe that ultimately it's the founder's decision, right? We're investing for the life cycle of a company. We're not investing to try to pull out on secondaries in the, in the second round in the series A or series B. Uh, we're investing for the life cycle of the company, you know, until there's an acquisition or IPO. Um, so we're not going to tell them like, Hey, things are not working out. You need to shut this thing down. We're never going to ask a founder like, Hey, shut this down and return, you know, part of our funds back or whatever. Um, I know some funds that do that, uh, or I've heard of funds that do that. Um, but no, again, we believe in the founder and I think we'll leave that choice to them. So you talk about mentorship a lot, you know, talk. So who are your mentors? Uh, yeah, I've had a lot of mentors. My, my biggest mentor is a guy named Marty Schaffel. And he uh, graduated from the University of Florida in 1979, I believe, or he was actually kicked out. Uh, and he started his first company around that time. So uh, his company was AVISPL. He built it to be the, lar the world's largest integrator and distributor of audiovisual equipment. They worked with the Department of Defense. They worked with Disney. They worked with some of the largest companies in the world. Um, and they sold for multi nine figures. And when he sold the company, he was 100% shareholder in the company, which is almost unheard of for a company of that scale. This is very, very rare. And by the way, he bootstrapped that company. He started it with, I believe he had $2,000 in his bank account. He was living in a $400 a month apartment and had nothing to his name, basically, besides that. So um, yeah, it's very rare to, to meet somebody of that caliber. Um, I'm blessed and very fortunate that I had the opportunity to learn from him. He was, uh, he still is actually to this day, a professor at the university of Florida. He donated a million dollars to UF and he runs his class the way he wants to run it. He told UF, he's like, I don't want you to pay me, but let me run my class how I want to run it. Uh, so he has like an application process. You have to apply to get into his course. And I took his class. It was life-changing for me. Um, I cannot stress it enough, like just a couple of weeks of being into his course. And by the way, I, I can't say that we would have ever built 161 Ventures if it wasn't for him, because just about three weeks into that class, we got together for some cigars on the rooftop of a hotel in town and a couple of drinks. And it was just me and a couple of my student entrepreneur buddies who want to learn from, from this guy. And we're, you know, we're talking and we're having some really inspiring conversations. And he says, I got to bring you guys to Tampa to this event that I do. He said, I started this event called the Empty Bottle Club. And we're like, really? Tell us about it. And he says, well, a couple of years ago, one of, one of our really good friends had a big scare with cancer. He was diagnosed with stage three cancer. And I, he called me on the phone and told me this and I didn't know how to react. I was speechless. And I got off the phone and I called up a couple of our other really good friends. And I said, hey, so-and-so has stage three cancer. When he recovers, we need to get together on a regular basis. We got to take all these super expensive, fancy bottles of whiskey, wine, bourbon on our shelves. And let's enjoy them together because otherwise we're going to pass away. Our kids are going to empty them or sell them yeah. or give them away or drink them. So let's enjoy them and let's enjoy the company of each other while we're still here, while we still have that time. So they started the empty bottle club in Tampa. They got, they, they would get together. They still do it to this day, but it's become very private, very secluded, very, very exclusive. And it's all these individuals that have achieved remarkable things like nine figure companies, like the founder of like coast dental, which has like over 200 dental practices in the country. Um, uh, executives from like some of the largest hospitals in Florida. There's like presidents and CEOs of large banks in Florida. Uh, these are just all people who have achieved, you know, a lot of them have had nine figure exits. And so we're sitting on this rooftop and he's telling us about this event. And we say, wow, we would love to go. Next thing you know, two weeks later, we're driving down with Marty to go to the next empty bottle club in Tampa. And at the time we were like, 22 or 23 years old. 
And all of a sudden we're in this room with some of the most accomplished people in Florida. You want to, in the what, US, what, 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 I'm in the what I'm doing here, like how this even happened. How this even happened. Yeah. We're talking with people and we're just mind blown about the things that they've accomplished. And we got back to Gainesville and we felt so inspired. We said, you know what? We need to do something about this. We can't pretend this didn't just happen. Oh, yeah. So we said, let's create, <laughs> let's create the empty bottle club of Gainesville. And that's, that was the origin of 161. Okay. So we started doing these monthly events and the whole idea was let's get together. Let's share some good times with other young, ambitious people that are trying to build stuff, right? So it was different. We didn't have this network and we couldn't bring in all these nine figure guys, but, or guys and girls, but, uh, but we could invite all of these young entrepreneurs who were hungry and wanted to build things. And so Marty would always come to our events. And over time he started bringing, he would always bring guest speakers for his class that were super high caliber. And we would bring those guest speakers to our events. Okay. And so next thing, you know, um, our events grew quite a bit. And after two years of, of doing these events, we actually, um, so we, we started hearing that, or we started feeling like the name was kind of prohibitive in some way, or was kind of limiting the potential of our organization. We had no, even though it was called empty bottle club, it wasn't about drinking. I mean, obviously we would drink at the events, but like, it wasn't about that. And some people might think that it's all about that. So then we felt weird inviting like city officials and university officials. And so we said, we need to rebrand. We want to help startup founders. An empty bottle club is not a good name for that. So we said, all right, let's get together for dinner. I mean, that's a good name for a college club though, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. So we got together for dinner and we had a four hour brainstorming session over dinner and in the beginning there was five of us it wasn't just me and my co-founder justice it was five of us all best friends um a lot of us are still really good friends to this day and we got together at one of our one of our buddies houses one of them uh, uh son and uh his name's son and um and so we we're, we're just brainstorming our different ideas like throwing out names and you know what what should we name this thing and the name uh or somebody said says what if we named it after a, a ratio, like, or yeah, like a, yeah. a number, yeah. like, and then somebody says, what about like the golden ratio? Okay. Yeah. And then we say, oh, that sounds interesting. Uh, we look it up. We're like, oh, okay. So the numbers are 1.619, all these other numbers. We're like, so 161. And we started thinking, we're like, hmm, interesting. Um, okay. This could be, this could be something. And then we're like, all right. I say after talking it out more and more and more by, by the end of the night, we said, all right, let's go ahead and say this unless in the next like week or two, we come up with something better and we never did. And um, so, so yeah, so basically we named it one, six, one ventures after the Fibonacci sequence or the golden ratio, okay. which is uh, 1.61 and naturalists say it's the most efficient ratio for growth to occur. And so for us, we wanted to create a community for startups to grow as efficiently as possible. And that's why we named it 161. So, so follow up question, who are you mentoring? And I want you to focus on not your startup founder, like some of your, your mentoring that's not a startup founder in your portfolio, if you can. Yeah, great question. Um, I, I, I think the importance of mentoring cannot be overstated. Like I think it's, <laughs> there's people that can go on to accomplish remarkable things that came from very humble beginnings if they have the right mentors. So for me, I want to give back to other people that maybe came from a similar background to me. So um, particularly, I mentor a lot of students at the University of Florida, some of them startup founders, some of them dropouts, some of them alumni, and um, it's a combination. Some of them are looking to, uh, some of them are not UF alumni, by the way. Uh, a lot of them are underrepresented. The majority are underrepresented. So either uh, female, Latino, Black, um, and, and usually it's either a startup founder um, who's first time startup founder trying to figure out, you know, how to get started, how to get some traction, how to raise capital, um, or it's somebody who wants to break into the venture capital space. And usually whenever I meet a young person, uh, when, when I say young, whenever I meet a, a student, um, or somebody who's like, like a teenager or early twenties that wants to break into venture capital, and they already know that it, for me, that is really exciting. And I really want to help them. Because to be completely honest with you, about six years ago, I didn't even know what venture capital was. 
Like I'm being completely honest, like at the university of Florida, I probably heard the word venture capital like once or twice, you know, and this goes back to, to that educational gap, right? There hasn't been that because we haven't had a bunch of tech founders build unicorns and then come back and mentor and advise and teach. Right. So, so yeah, I, I want to pay it forward. I want to give back. And so I mentor a lot of people that want to break into venture capital. Let's suppose someone's watching this and they, they have a startup in your, in your thesis, right? How do they reach out to you? Is it cold email? Like, how does that work? Like, how do they get on your radar, so to speak? Yeah, um, cold email or even LinkedIn. So I'm actually, unlike some people, I'm actually very active on LinkedIn and very, or very responsive on LinkedIn, I should say. And the thing is, it's all about how you frame the message, right? So some people, I, I don't reply to a lot of messages on LinkedIn because a lot of them are, I don't think that- Hi, Pablo. I need a million dollars or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Right? Or somebody's like, hi, we're raising money for our startup, which is doing X, Y, and Z in um, and we're close to your thesis. Yeah, they're out there outside of the US. We only invest in US. Or they're raising a series A or series B. Like, why are you reaching out to me? Or like pre-IPO, like, you know, it's like things that are not a good fit. So I don't reply to a lot of that stuff because if you're met, if you're reaching out to me and you're saying things like that, it's very clear to me that you, you didn't, didn't, you did no research. No you didn't even go on my LinkedIn yeah, page. Yeah. Like if you go on my LinkedIn page and spend 30 seconds reading, then you already know, like kind of a little bit about what we're looking for. So, um, but yeah, I mean, if you send me a message and you say like, Hey, like I'm so-and-so I'm looking to learn more about venture. Uh, it definitely helps if there's some commonality, maybe like you went to the University of Florida or you're from Florida or um, you're Latino. Or I'm, a master, I'm a master salsa dancer, just like you. <laughs> yeah, that would be, <laughs> that'd be one way to stand out. I like to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or I like to dance salsa. Um, so yeah, I think uh, those, are, those are good ways to stand out, right? So I know you're pre seed Is this this thing as someone being too early to come reach out to you? Like they only have an idea or, you know, like what's, is this thing being too early to start that um, relationship with you, so to speak? never too early to start a relationship. Uh, obviously too early, there's going to be too early for funding. Uh, we invest at the stage that we call uh, post-product pre-significant traction. Mm -hmm. So we want to see a product in market, even if there's not a lot of revenue or any revenue, we want to see, you know, some data about pilot tests, uh, you know, several months of data about engagement, uh, retention, um, you know, how often are people using it? Yeah, for that, how many days do you want to see like the 90 days? 60 days, six yeah, months. I'd say about like three months is pretty good. If we can see like they launched a beta or pilot three months ago, and then there's been consistent growth and positive data uh, over that period, like then that's that's a good spot, right? Uh, that's like on the early end of like where, where we like to invest basically. Uh, we have done one like pre-product, but we don't normally uh, do pre-product investments. So what's our definition of MVP? MVP is... Uh, I would say, I think that should be a pretty standard definition. Uh, it's the earliest version of the product that can actually solve a pain point or problem for the customer so that it's actually usable. Okay. So you, with an MVP, you should be able to have somebody like test it, right? An MVP should be something that you can put in front of somebody and like say, hey, could you test this out or could you use this or does this help you with your problem and then get some feedback and then start iterating. All right. So you you always talk about your company some like can you talk more like how I got started what you focus on now what your vision for it is like like 10, 20 years from now like you want to be the next Sequoia or like what's your plan like one six one going in the future? Yeah, I, I mean I don't want to say next Sequoia, but they're definitely a big inspiration and uh, they've helped shape a lot of the way we think. Um, but we want to be a top tier venture capital firm in the in the country, right? Um, there's not a lot of firms that can be considered in in the, the tier one firms category. Um, and I think uh, our, our goal is to be there maybe, you know, I'd say probably 15, 20 years from now, maybe less, maybe 10 years from now, um, even though that's ambitious. But, uh, but yeah, our goal is to be one of the firms that can bring the most value to our portfolio companies. Uh, and we want to do that by thinking differently, by taking a different approach, by doing the things that other firms are not willing to do. My mentor, Marty, that I told you about, he would always say this one quote, which is actually very simple. And it's, he would say, successful people are willing to do the things that unsuccessful people are not willing to do. 
And it sounds so simple, but it's actually so true. And so we're willing to do things that other VC firms are not willing to do. And I think that that's going to give us a competitive edge. Um, but again, we are so early on. And so 20 years from now, um, if I have to take, you know, a guess, obviously that's, this could be really far off the mark, but we'll be raising our, I don't know, seventh or eighth fund at that point, maybe, or maybe six, six, six or seventh fund potentially at that point. And, um, we'll be backing. I, I can't say that we'll be backing the same type of founders that are same type of companies that we're backing today. Our thesis might change and we might go more broad or more narrow based on the data and what we learn um, over the next decade or two. Uh, but we will be backing, you know, the goal is to be backing the best founders, the, you know, world-class founders and adding as much value as we can to them and being one of the firms known for adding the most value. So I can't think of a better term, but there's such, is there like a, some, some, some type of Yelp for founders can rate VC? It's not kind of platform where people can say, hey, I had a good relationship with this VC. I didn't have a good relationship. There's, like there? there's not. Um, but this is basically, basically like water mouth for founders that's so talking about VCs. Y Combinator has like an internal platform where they actually do rank VCs and investors and angels. Um, I believe it's called Bookface. Um, and it was built by Gary Tan, who's now the president of Y Combinator. So they've got something that's pretty interesting. I think long term, you know, we'll have something internally too. As you as you grow and you can start, you know, you, you start developing new tools, you you need new tools to solve different problems. And so obviously long term, you know, we'll have our own like, you know, in in-house like software or dev team. Uh, but but yeah, no, there is nothing public uh, okay. like that. Okay. Yeah, as far as I know. How does it work? I like, suppose you're, you're, you're going to invest in our founder. You really, you know, really like the founder, the company, right? But the other VC, the person brings in, like, co-invest with you, you're like, hey, I don't know about this person, right? Our values don't match. Like, you like, just say, okay, I'll, I'll back the founder no matter what. Or like, because this other VC doesn't align with your values, you're like, hey, founder, I got to pass on this because me and this other VC are not going to match for each other. That's a good question. Uh, that really depends on where the mismatch is. If we're talking about that we misalign on our vision for the future, or we don't align on what types of companies we think are home runs or whatever that is, that's not a problem. The issue is when we don't align on what is ethical. And if there's something that we believe is unethical about that partner or that firm, uh, that could sway our decision on whether or not to invest in a company, for sure. Usually the other investors on the cap table is, is we always take that into account, uh, but usually there's not like any red flags. I think those are rare situations where there might be. There's other, there's definitely like other firms that we, um, that we have heard negative things about, but maybe not so much on like doing things that lack integrity or unethical. But maybe just so much so that like they maybe they waste a little bit of the founder's time sometimes, or maybe they're just not very value add and they say they do, uh, <laughs> which is a big pool of, of VCs probably. But in those cases, that may not sway our decision as much because at the end of the day, we're we're back in the founder. So all the founders you've you've invested in so far, you ain't, do all of them have like one characteristic that drew you to all of them? It's a great question. I think the main characteristic that comes to mind is they are all, they're all obsessed with what they're building. Their startup is their life in a way. This is not like a, they don't treat it like a full-time job or nine to five. They, this is their entire it's life. It's like three full-time jobs. <laughs> yeah. This is all they think about. They care deeply about the problem that they're solving and they care deeply about the people that they're solving that problem for. Uh, I would say those are the main commonalities, but all very different. You know, some of them more on the introverted side, some of them more on the shy side, some of them incredible salespeople, some of them incredibly extroverted, some of them incredible public speakers, some of them not so much. Uh, but yeah, they, I would say that's the main thing that they have in common. So are your 10 companies, can you break down like how many are solo founders, how many are like co-founders, how many have like three or more founders? 
So we typically, we tend not to invest so much in solo founders. I think building a startup is incredibly hard. And we particularly are interested in teams that can build really well. So they have the technical capacity and can sell really well. So they have great communication skills. And oftentimes that's usually two co-founders yeah. at least. So most of our, our portfolio companies have two or three co-founders. Uh, we have one in the portfolio that's a solo founder, only one. Okay. And why did you choose to back this person as a solo founder? Yeah. So this is actually, uh, her name is Daniela Blanco and she's the founder of uh, Synthetics, which is a company using AI to optimize the, uh, uh, to optimize chemical processes, to reduce chemical waste. And we were really, really impressed with, I mean, her ability to communicate. She's an incredible presenter. I actually met her at a TED talk. She was giving a TED talk, uh, or TEDx, I should say. And she has a PhD in chemical engineering from uh, I mean, NYU. Kind of impressive. She's an immigrant. She came here from Venezuela. And on top of having a PhD in chemical engineering, she taught herself how to, how to code and how to be an AI engineer. Obviously, she's not the main person you know, doing development now at her company. But in the beginning, she built out the first version of their yeah. product. She was a really core part of building that out. And so for us, we were, it checked all the boxes, right? It, it she had, she could build and she could sell. So basically she blew y'all, like, she blew you away then. Yeah, absolutely. Like um, this person is a superstar right here. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we just had a catch up call with her yesterday and she's making tons of progress and it's exciting to see. Now do you, where she's at. of course you don't tell what to do, but you always like tell her, Hey, maybe you want to, want to think about bringing a co-founder or bringing some help or you just like, Hey, you got it right now. Just run with it. That's a good question. Uh, we never really pushed on her to have a co-founder. We, we, I mean, we thought like, uh, I, th I think we had some conversations about her with it, but, uh, but we trust her judgment. Again, going back to the, this principle of uh, we invest in founders we believe in, and we believe that she knows what's best for her company. So we kind of let her run it in the direction that she believes. And so she's brought on a really strong technical team but has not brought on a technical co-founder or any co-founder for that matter. Now, that doesn't mean that the early employees are not getting compensated with stock in any way. Uh, it's just a little bit of a different role or different perspective. Yeah, I, wrong. I think one way it might be an advantage having just a solo founder because you can give more options to your employees, right? So instead of like maybe getting 40% or 45% to a co-founder, you can divide that more to early, early employees, you know? I think it might be one of that if you can do the solo founder route. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. You got more, a larger, uh, larger option pool. So, yeah. So the company invested in, are they like all of the United States, like pretty like spread out geographically or like, are they focused in like one location? Yeah, pretty spread out. Uh, we don't have a geographic focus. We now have two portfolio companies in Seattle. Uh, funny enough, one of them relocated uh, to Seattle. And then the other one is a recent investment. And uh, yeah, we've got one in Texas. I think one in uh, SF, uh, two in New York. So yeah, they're kind of spread out. They're all over the place. We have some in Florida, of course, a uh, couple in Florida. So yeah. So how does, from your point of view, how does 161 succeed? We succeed by bringing more value to our portfolio companies than any other firm. Because ultimately, if we want to get into the best deals, the only way we're going to do that is by, is by demonstrating to them that we've been able to do this for our portfolio companies and we can do it for them as well. So the other thing is that if we can move the needle for any of our portfolio companies, then that's more than 90% of VCs can do for their portfolio companies. Because the majority, I, I think the majority of founders would say that there wasn't a single investor that was absolutely instrumental or that really moved the needle for their company, right? I think it's very few founders that can say that about one of their investors. Um, so I, I think if we can do that for our portfolio companies, then we we can achieve we can become a tier one firm we can we can become one of the top firms in the country and we can get some of the best deal flow in the country and we can have some of the best uh returns as well for our investors for our lps um, so yeah it's all about working our butts off to be able to support our portfolio companies as much as we can and of course the follow-up question how do you all fail how do you not, not make it so to speak yeah um I guess this is something I haven't given a lot of thought to because we have like a vision for what we're, we're what we're doing and how we're going to get there. And we're just so hyper-focused on that. 
Um, there's not really a backup plan. So, but I guess if I give it some thought, how do we fail? We fail by not doing proper diligence on deals. We fail by not being able to add value to our portfolio. I mean, because you do have to hit, hit at least a single once in a while, right? A single what? You, you, do, you still I mean, you have to hit a single every once in a while, right? Home run a single. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. Can't, you can't strike out every single time. Yeah. VCs operate on the power law, right? And so the majority of returns come from a very small amount of the portfolio. And so we have to be able to get those outliers in order to have good returns for our investors. So, uh, so yeah, if, uh, if we're not able to provide a lot of value for our portfolio companies, if we're not able to build our brand, if we're not able to source deals, uh, quality deals, right. And get into good deals that can give us good returns. Um, then that could lead to some challenges with raising another fund or, with continuing to move forward. So, so you talk several times about being a tier one VC, like who determines who's a tier one VC is tier two, all that kind of stuff. That's a good question. I actually don't know who determines that. I just know that uh, it's widely accepted that like, I mean, Sequoia is obviously, Sequoia, you know. I believe A16Z for sure. And then like Madrona would be yeah. considered a tier one. So I, I know that there's like these firms that everybody views in this light that mm -hmm. they're like, you oh, I'll get money from them. You're yeah. guaranteed to make it all that kind of stuff, you know? Right. And it could be game changing. Like all of a sudden, if you, if Madrona backs your company, I mean, that's going to be featured on the news and you can leverage that to get contracts to get, you have, you have more credibility in a way, yeah. right? It gives you more credi credibility. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know who determines who's tier one. Yeah. I, I assume it's like the founders yeah. and I assume it's something that that's not like an overnight thing. It's like, you have to have consistently you know, provided this amount of help to your companies and moved the needle for them and gotten into the best deals and had this many exits or this type of returns for your LPs. So I'm sure there's like a lot of qualifications there. Um, and so you, you only do pre-seed, correct? We do, uh, we do pre-seed and seed, but, pre -seed. but we don't advertise that we do seed because we, we prim we're primarily interested in pre-seed. So if your, your companies that are with you right now, What's the plan, you know, suppose they, they do all the stuff they got to do and they're going to raise the A round. How do you help them raise the A round? Great question. So we help them raise an A round by building relationships with other VCs that invest, you know, a little bit more downstream. So we have actually sourced deals for a lot of other VC firms in the state of Florida. Uh, we've now sourced some deals for some VCs in, in Seattle as well. And uh, those are opportunities for us to be able to, um, to help our portfolio companies, right? We have those relationships. Uh, they know what we're about. When we send them a deal, they're willing to take a look at it. And uh, it, it, there's, there's no shortcut to that. You have to build a relationship. You have to demonstrate that you can get quality deal flow. And you have to, sh you have to prove that the founders that you work with respect you and they value you as an investor on their cap table. And so we have to work really hard to, to be able to have that status and be able to get these other firms to respond to some of our some of our poor, and it's also a little bit of a scarcity, creating scarcity too, right? Yeah. So like we have, uh, our, I told you about the Holocron. Jump on the bandwagon before it's too late. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I told you about the Holocron investment, which uh, was backed by uh, New North and Winklevoss Capital. And we sent that deal to a couple of firms in Florida and, you know, VCs are busy people. They have a lot of inbound. And even though these are people that we have a relationship with that know us really well, and they know the quality of our deal flow, uh, let's just say uh, one of them did not reply. And about a month ago, it was featured on the news on the Tampa Bay Business Journal. Uh, and the whole article was about like the Winklevoss, like how Winklevoss twins back the startup. But anyways, as soon as that came out, this VC firm contacted us and I'm, said- I'm sure they did. Or not contacted us, contacted that startup yeah. and said, hey, how do we get into this round? Or are you still raising? Can we put something in? Um, so again, there's a lot of, uh, signaling is super important in this industry. Uh, not so much for returns per se, or for quality of deal, but like for a startup to fundraise, like signaling matters a lot. If you want to, if you want to close some funding, if you want to raise some capital and it's more important than it should be for VCs, for investors. So if somebody's going to fundraise, are they supposed to like make a big announcement? Hey, I'm fundraising now, or is it like they do it undercover? Like what's your advice on that? Yeah, no. Um, what I usually advise founders to do is be very methodical about your fundraising approach. So don't just go out there and pitch everybody. Don't just announce that you're fundraising, run it like a process that it should be right. So 
put together a list of a spreadsheet of potential investors, do your, do your work, do your research, go through LinkedIn, find 30 to 50 investors, uh, firms and angels, right? Especially if it's earlier stage, you want to do more angels because the likelihood that they're, they're going to invest is higher, but put together the spreadsheet and then start sending targeted messaging to each one of those individuals to so get no, in front of them. So no automated email, just take the time, personalize, even though it's going to suck and use time you don't, you don't have, you got to do that extra process, right? Extra yes, step, right? exactly. Yeah. Personalize, make it specific and don't make it clear that you're fundraising right away. Even if you are, this is the biggest mistake that founders make is they come at it from a place of urgency of like, I need to get this capital or like, Hey, we're investing. Uh, I'm sorry. Hey, we're raising this much. Are you interested? No, uh, treat it the same way VCs treat it. It's a relationship game. It's a long-term game. Say you want to reach out to a VC cold, reach out to them and say, Hey, I would love to get your perspective on what we're doing. We're not fundraising at the moment, uh, but we will be later this year or in a couple of months. And I'd love to get your thoughts on what we're doing. If you say something like this, this shows a lot of maturity to a VC as a founder. It, show, it shows that you are not, you're not hungry for the capital right now. You don't need it right now. You're not like, you're not, you don't have that urgency, right? Yeah. If you have that urgency, it's like the VCs can sense it and they get discouraged. They get, yeah. they lose the interest. But if you come at it from a perspective of like, Hey, we've got this, we got these pilots going, we have this traction. I'd love to get your thoughts on what we're doing. We're going to be opening up around later this year. And I'd love to get some advice on how to navigate the fundraising process. That is a great way to reach out to a VC and start building the relationship early. Any founder that reaches out to me with that type of approach, I'm going to respond to as long as it's like US based, mm -hmm. because we don't do anything outside of the US and we won't for a while. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's, again, be very methodical about the approach and it's, uh, it's going to work a lot better. When should a founder, like they're not being successful, when should they stop and go back to the drawing board, so to speak? With what? With fundraising. Their, oh, with fundraising. Yeah. Um, so I would say like, you need to have a little bit of traction. If it's your first time ever fundraising, you should never like completely abandon operations or growing the company to go fundraise. Because if you're super early on and it's your first time raising capital, chances are the majority of VCs are going to say no. And the majority of angels are also going to say no. So you need to make sure that you're continuing to make progress and traction. And so if a founder reaches out to me and they send me like this, you know, the highlights of like what they're doing and the traction they have. And, and then three months later, they want to pitch me or something. And there hasn't been any update or any progress or nothing new. It's like, I'm probably not going to be interested in, in having that conversation or not interested in investing. Right. So treat it again, like a long-term thing, build those relationships. And um, if it's not working, oftentimes it just means you haven't communicated what you're doing properly, or you don't have enough traction or your approach. You're not taking the right approach to fundraising. So try to figure out what's not working about it. Oftentimes it's the first two. It's the, uh, or the, the lack of traction and the um, the lack of traction and then finding people that are right fit for that particular deal or sorry, communicating it properly. Communicating it so properly. Pablo, you're doing a lot, right? Yeah. So on day-to-day -day, day -day basis, how do you make sure you focus on parties one, two, or three versus party number 10,001? Good question. Um, I, I, everything that I do is aligned with what are the goals for our firm, right? And so Right now, as a as an emerging fund manager, you know, raising fund one and getting into our first couple of portfolio uh, or making our first couple of portfolio investments, the main priorities are fundraising, right? Finding new LPs to invest in our fund, um, finding quality deals to invest in, and then supporting our portfolio founders. So everything that I do is related to those three things, and uh, anything that's outside of that, I. I, I try not to allocate too much time to, and if I realize that I am allocating too much time to, then I, you know, go back to the drawing board and try to, you know, optimize my schedule. 
But the majority of things that I'm doing nowadays is related to those things. E even if some of it might not seem directly correlated, but like, for example, doing events, doing events checks all those boxes in some capacity. And so that's a really, you wouldn't think about it, but like, you know, people often wonder what, what does a VC's day-to-day -day look like? And my day-to-day, -day, a lot of it is like planning events, organizing events. Um, but yeah. So is there anything else that I asked you that I didn't, or anything else you want to talk about? Um, anything else that I want to talk about? Uh, I don't think so. Nothing else comes to mind. Um, yeah. Hey, Pablo, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Jason. It was awesome. Great conversation. And to listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.